The meeting will come to order. And Officer Todd Stoker is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Officer Stoker has been with us since 1997, and before that, he served in the Army. So, Officer Stoker, I know you're going to resign soon, but thank you for your service to our police department, our community, and our country. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we'll have the invocation by uh, Chaplain McCann. Good morning. I'm not Chaplain McCann. I'm Dr. Sarita Wright, one of the other Kansas City chaplains, and I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Doctor, I'm so sorry. That's all right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each and every individual that's gathered here today. We thank you for the officers that serve this great city. We thank you for the mayor and our police chief. We thank you for this board. We ask God today that you will guide them, that you will lead them, give them direction, wisdom, knowledge, and clarity. And we thank you that it is so in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing is a guest presentation from the city auditor on the community policing prevention fund. Welcome back. Good morning, board president. Dean, how are you today? We're good. Let me get this set up. There we go. Good morning, Board President Dean, members of the Board of Police Commissioners, Doug Jones, City Auditor. I'm here to present our audit of police department spending from the Community Policing and Prevention Fund for the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2023. I will discuss the audit objective, give you a little background, and summarize our findings. Copies of the audit report, the highlights page, and presentation slides are in your tab A of your board book. The team for the audit was Jonathan LeCure and Clinton Pullum. In March 2022, City Council passed Ordinance 220216, creating the Community Policing and Prevention Fund. The ordinance also directed the City Auditor to conduct quarterly audits of the Board of Police Commissioners' efforts to meet the City's expectations as outlined in the ordinance and report to the Council as soon as practical after the end of the fiscal quarter. Our audit address focuses on whether the Department spent the fund as expected by the Council during the quarter. To answer the objective, we assessed the method the department developed to report the fund spending and summarized all reporting categories. For the fourth quarter, we verified officers and staff were correctly reported in the categories of crisis intervention team and enhanced publicly available data reporting. We also verified the accuracy of reported changes in the number of recruits in the academy classes and reviewed the demographic profile and of the new and lateral recruits the department hired from February 2022 through April 2023, we conducted the audit in accordance with government auditing standards. The ordinance establishes the city's expectations regarding police department expenditures for $33.36 million in the 12 categories shown on this screen throughout fiscal year 2023. The department reported allocating the final 9.6 million of the fund appropriated to the CPP fund in the fourth quarter to eligible spending categories. A summary of those spending allocated to each category is shown in Exhibit 2 on page 4 of the audit report. While the police department expended the fund within the categories approved by the council, they did not expend all categories and amounts as originally approved or, or uh, appropriated. The department expended about $5 million from seven spending categories that was not spent in those categories and transferred that to cover expenses in four other categories. All of this was within the CPP fund. The Board of Police Commissioners approved the department's request to transfer these funds within the line items of the CPP fund. The department reported it was unable to expend the fund balances within the original categories due to hiring challenges and attrition. The department also reported that it did not charge eligible salary expenses such as health and life insurance costs within some of the spending categories because of time constraints. The department reported allocating 829,000 for 79, 79 staff members to the fund by the end of the fourth quarter because Academy Class 178's 24 cadets began the final week of the fiscal year. Their class was not charged to the fund in the fourth quarter. 
about 1.5 million from the 4 million allocated to this category was used in other CPP fund categories. Between, fiscal, between February 22 and April of 2023, the department hired 103 officers. This includes lateral recruits, officers graduated from the academy, now on assignment, and officers currently in the academy. Lateral recruits are those officers who work for a law enforcement agency other than Kansas City prior to joining the department, and those officers do not have to attend a full academy session. For the 103 officers who were hired or began the academy between February 2022 and April of 2023, the police department reported that 82% were male, 18% were female. Additionally, they reported 65% were white, 14% were black, 11% were of mixed heritage, 8% were Hispanic, and 3% were Asian. As part of our work for this audit, we reviewed the department's budgeting practices and found the department's adopted budgets did not plan for appropriations from the city that were less than the department requested. The Government Finance Officers Association recommended practices state that local government entities should evaluate revenue and expenditure options together prior to making final budgetary decisions, ensure expenditures identify service level assumptions and key issues that may be may affect actual expenditures and describe expenditure assumptions in relation to the revenue assumptions. In fiscal years 23 and 24, the city increased appropriations year to year, but the appropriated amounts were less than requested by the police department. In both years, the department's adopted budget included a placeholder for the known revenue shortfall. In fiscal year 23, the adopted budget shows most of this lower appropriation as salary assessment, salary savings assessment, and in fiscal 24, the adopted budget shows the lower appropriation as efficiency cuts to contractual services. The police department staff state they are required to adopt the line item budget the city council appropriates to them, even if it leaves a large unplanned item. It is city staff's practice to account for most of that, single, that difference in a single line item in areas other than personnel. However, city staff state that they anticipate the department would evaluate and adjust specific line items based on how the police department and the police board wish to manage department resources. A budget that plans for lower than expected revenues should identify what specific line items the department plans to reduce to account for the lower revenue, but not as a single line item that requires future decisions. While the city council has certain requirements under state law for appropriating money to the police department, the P Board of Police Commissioners is responsible for determining how to itemize the funds appropriated by the city to operate the police department. GFOA recommended practices would expect that the police department should present to the police board a comprehensive budget for the board's consideration, which includes any known revenue shortfalls that will impact planned expenditures. The department has time to present a comprehensive budget that considers revenue and expenditure options together during the normal budgeting process. This is necessary to allow stakeholders to judge whether there is an appropriate balance of resources and priorities for assigned uses. Employing this approach fosters public understanding of how resources are used and promotes trust in the department and the board. The police department addresses the known shortfalls through budget transfers. While budget transfers are a routine part of operations to address variances in expenses and revenues, the department uses the budget transfer process instead of documenting in their adopted budget how they plan to use limited resources to operate the department. In both fiscal years 23 and 24, the board approved budget transfers the same day they adopted their budget. Throughout the current fiscal year 2024, the police board has been making monthly transfers to address the known budget shortfall. While the department's adopted budget is publicly posted and widely discussed, department transfers are not publicly posted. These budgeting practices may not be clear or transparent to decision makers, the city council, or the public. The department's current practices do not enhance stakeholders' understanding of important budget issues and trade-offs that will result from the city not appropriating all the funds included in the police department's budget request. This makes for a reactive approach involving monthly transfers from one expenditure category to support shortfalls in another category. We make one recommendation in this audit. The chief of police should submit an amended budget to the board of police commissioners that identifies planned line item spending based on the funds appropriated. The chief of police agreed in part with the recommendation for responses on page 18 of the audit report. We believe implementing this recommendation will improve the department's budgeting and budget planning process and promote transparency related to the department's budget. So in brief, the department expended all $33.36 million of the city council appropriate to the community policing and prevention fund and allocated those expenditures to eligible spending categories. 
However, about $5 million was not spent in seven categories, and that was transferred to cover expenditures greater than originally appropriated in four other categories. Again, that's all within the fund. Implementation of the audit recommendation should improve the department's budgeting process and increase transparency. I want to thank the department staff and the chief, as well as finance staff, for their assistance and input throughout this audit, as well as the three prior audits of the CPP fund. So, now that I've finished, I will let management for the police department talk about their response, and they'll be happy to answer any questions you have about the audit or their response. Good morning. If you could, could, could you please go back to page 12? I just kind of want to re respond to that. Um, and I just want to start off by saying why we're looking at our budget right now, and uh, I'm going to talk about that here in a second when, it, when it's for... <laughs> was for my comments. I just want to kind of talk about this specifically. Um, this last budget cycle, you know, we were provided a budget from, from city council that assessed us in contractual services. We've had a lot of conversations here, um, you know, in this venue about that. And I would say the 2023 police budget, you know, when, when we're, a, let me go back to the past. In the past, it's, it's my understanding the police department and, and city finance worked together to determine what our budget was. And over the past, I don't know how many years, we have just um, been provided what our budget is from city council and it's, it's approved. So when it comes over here, um, you see those big, big transfers. If we're, if we're assessed in, let's say we were this year, like in contractual services, um, you know, when we brought that, that budget over, when it's adopted by the, the board, you know, those big transfers happen that it happened in 23. I think that is um, less transparent than the way that we are working the budget now. In, in 2024, the 2024 budget, when we got that on May 1, um, there was an initial uh, want to transfer a large amount from uh, like let's say personnel to contractual services because we were assessed um, $13 million. And me as a chief, I did not think that that was the most transparent way of doing that and showing our budget. And that's why going forward, I ask that any funds that we take from one appropriated item to another, that we have those, those transfers and we talk about it in open board sessions to transfer those monies. Um, since May 1, we have discussed several times here in this venue about contractual services, the need to pay bills, as, as I think is how we, how we discussed it here. Um, I want nothing more than the, the, the leader of this agency to work closer with city finance on coming up with an amicable budget and in a transparent process. Um, next year, we hope to deliver a city council approved budget that will be the same as submitted to the board for adoption. Um, so years ago, like I said, this was previously the process and, and I want nothing more to replicate that. And I think that we can do that. I think that um, the, the, the part in the letter where I said, I agree, but in part, um, I didn't. And that was having the, the um, city finance assess us in, in specific areas like contractual services where those things are, are things that we um, are obligated to pay for. So I would like it to be where we have a conversation like this is how much um, money we can provide the police department and us work together with city finance and city council that whatever that budget is, when it comes over here, that's the same budget that we work on. So we don't have these, these transfers because this is calling into a, you know, um, a transparency issue. And it's, and really since May one, I've tried to make this, this a more transparent process that this is the monies that we need. And, and we do it. Um, it's caused a lot more work for our um, executive services, but I do feel like this is a more transparent process. I know it may not be posted, um, Mr. Jones, but um, we do talk about it a lot here in this open session. Did you have anything else on that? Thank you, Chief. Um, I was just going to reiterate what you were saying that we feel like we are transparent in the fact that we, we bring these to the monthly board meeting um, and make the transfers rather than 
um, doing it at the beginning of the, the fiscal year. We want to ensure that we keep the money in personal services, not cut there until we need to pull uh, from that category. But yeah, we believe that, that we have a transparent um, process here. I think this just brings a light that there's things that we can do better and improve on and better communication with the city um, sooner into the budget process than in the midst of it. So those are things that we're doing, reaching out to the city to get those meetings so that we can um, discuss which categories need to be um, reduced and which ones need to stay heavy. And I will say we do self-assess. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that we don't have, we're not fully staffed with a 1408, 1,408 uh, law enforcement. We do self-assess our 150 officers. Um, so we, you know, we don't submit a budget with a, a full staffing because we know that not only do we not have that, but um, the likelihood of us attaining 300 officers in a year, as much as I would love to do that, um, <coughs> I mean, we can try, but it just hasn't been. I'm sitting next to uh, the admin bureau with, with human resources. Um, but we self-assess our, ourselves in ways, but we are going to have a more um, conversational, transparent process with this new budget as we move forward. And, and I'll add one more thing. And, and um, Acting Major Josh Heinen has been basically the focus point or the focal point in coordinating with the, the city auditor. So he's, he's pretty in depth and in tune with the, um, the way the audit went. Um, but I will say back to the community policing and prevention fund where we had to move money out of some categories into another within that same fund um, was because those categories were shorted uh, when the funds came over to us in the beginning. So we had no choice but to move out of the the categories that were um, overfunded, if you will, to uh, cover those services. So I just wanted to make that that point clear. But you understand that we approve those transfers at any board meeting where they brought to us. It's all done in public at a meeting like this. Correct, and we mentioned that in the audit. We give full credit for that being done publicly. The issue is it doesn't show up in your budget document. It's hard to track what happened. So let's say that there's a line item with $10 million in it and you transfer 2 million out of that. When the budget gets trued up showing actual expenditures at some point the year after, it's gonna show you expended 8 million instead of the 10 million because that 2 million got moved someplace else. It's just hard to track where those changes came from. So it's important to know up front when you know you're gonna be short what you thought address that plan of budget and expenditures to start the year instead of addressing that throughout the year. You're making those decisions, but more on a month by month, case by case basis, instead of saying, we have this much money, here's how we plan to spend it. And just making that change. And I'm hearing that discussion. So it's all about how do we get that process adjusted to what the actual appropriation is by the time we get it issued at the submitted budget in February, through the council approving it by late March to you seeing it and approving it before May 1. So it's how do we fix this so it's transparent for everybody, including you. You know, when you see a transfer, it's like, what's going on here? Let's make sure that everybody knows what's happening. And that's what we're talking about, implementing some recommended practices from the Government Finance Officers Association. So with that, I'll step back and let Major take over. Well, Madam Chair, I have a question or a series of questions. If I mean, and they're actually for the city auditor to start. Um, and I just assume since he's been at the city much longer than I have, he can explain a few different processes. And I'm gonna ask you questions perhaps that aren't um, in this report, but things that I would expect you to understand rather broadly. Because a number of city departments do not receive the budget allocation that they are regularly requesting. Is that That's accurate? correct. And how do we typically address that? I'll use an, an example department, parks, which is probably most analogous to this group. They're appointed by a board. Um, the Board of Parks and Recreation Commissioners have substantial charter authority to run parks without control of city council necessarily. So when they don't receive their budget allocation as requested, how typically do they address that in later practice? My broad understanding of the budget process, some of it's based on my experiences, would be 
the department would have to look at specific line items to say, okay, we wanted to spend X dollars here, but we only can spend Y dollars. So they make adjustments throughout their whole budget document to identify where those shortfalls are gonna be addressed. And that's done in, and you see that in their final budget document. And again, it's some of that is how the budgeting in the city is set up versus the budgeting for the police board. It's, there's that extra hurdle or time frame in there, but mostly when the city staff or city departments have to deal with it, they make adjustments throughout their budget to address whatever shortfall that they have. And at what point is that adjustment represented to some entity? So, so you also actually, the auditor's office is an independent charter authority that does not report to the city manager, does report directly to the city council. If we were to follow these types of practices you're describing, how do you do it now? Or how would you know departments to address them? We submit our budget. We follow the, the guidance from the budget office. And then part of our process is we give it to you and the council members before we give it to the city manager to look at it to see what you think. But then we submit our budget to the city manager's office and they look at it and they may take some things out of it. And then we see, sometimes we see that before the council sees it, or and sometimes we have to wait until it's submitted. And then we have to work and go, okay, here's where they've taken out those items. And some of it is a discussion. You know, there are presentations and discussions with management, the budget office, and there's a little give and take. And then maybe you have to go back through the amendment process after the submitted budget is issued to say, hey, we need some money. I know one year they took staff out that just because they were retirement eligible, they deleted those positions. Like they weren't retiring. So we had to go through the amendment process to keep them in. So there are processes in place, but our budget reflects what we get and how it's going to be expended throughout the year. And there are some transfers that you make, but it's because the operations has changed, but we're not trying to address a known shortfall on May 1. Understood. A question, or, or actually more of a, a comment that I will have um, is, and I commend the chief for the collaborative process. Um, and perhaps this is just a bit, of, it's not pessimism, it's actually optimism and respect for our elected officials and these commissioners. We want to all agree on a budget, but fundamentally, 13 people are elected by the people of Kansas City to actually opine on what the budget should be ultimately. So while this board can give a recommendation, we still do want to give authority to the city council to say any number of things. We want more, we want less, we want to give the auditor more. We want to do any number of things. So I think the question that arises is what happens where there is disagreement. And then to the extent there is disagreement, as, as has existed in every budget that I've been around for, um, and with almost every department, except perhaps KCFD. And actually, there's even disagreement there often. But nonetheless, how do we address that in the budget year? So folks do end up, I think, no. And I know we we do vote on transfers, but I think the one point that I would say that is a bit confusing, is there a way that you will know the transfers to come throughout the year? I think I remember we talked about, for example, so I guess question one was that, how do you address disagreement? Question two is more specific. And I remember, made, uh, Colonel, we had a discussion on waste management, for example, and you were noting that if not each month regularly, because there was an assessment to some entity that we'll have to just have that cut go throughout the year and that you would bring them regularly throughout the year. So perhaps the vote is something that's monthly, but the plan is something that seems to be known further up front. Is there some way that that can be shared so folks know where um, the transfers, if any, would be coming and when they'd be coming? But okay. I guess it's start with you. I know we're fighting for the mic. Uh, <laughs> generally speaking, I would say when we, when we get that budget, let's just talk about this current budget year. Um, the city council or the city finance made the assessments. Cut, cut me off if I'm if I'm if I'm not accurate. They they make the assessments not by with, with without working with us on that. And I'm not I'm not bl shifting blame or anything like that because I want the process to be to be better for it to be more collaborative and for us to to work on the budget together. But um, we're provided a budget in this last um, this last budget cycle. You know, we have all these uh, assessments in some of our contractual services. So I, f I feel like if we would have worked together on that budget prior to and us saying, hey, well, we need funds over here, we need funds over here, that we wouldn't have as many budget transfers as we have right now. So that's why that's why it's so important 
for, for this team right here to make sure that, that we are working collaboratively um, with, with city finance on what that should look like. So we're not having this discussion next year. I mean, briefly, while you, I still have the question for you, but you made some good points. I would, I would submit to you, though, the city council, having been one for eight years, won't necessarily rubber stamp what the city finance department provides either. Indeed, that's the whole budget process. It's, it's based on changing it, or else we would just ratify what the city manager provides and, and not have the meetings and not go through all the extra work. And so... Assuming that we will continue to have that material difference, I guess, how do we address that going forward? And I may add one other point. Um, not that things aren't looked at more closely by your elected officials, but what I would say is we tend to actually talk about a whole number, right? Last year, yeah. you came to city council and discussed needing, I believe, an extra $8 million or $13 million, right? We don't typically say... It's for this, 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 and this. Instead, it is looking at the police department budget as a whole number, which has been a lot of our focus the last several years, for better or worse, mm -hmm. right? And then saying, should there be more or less? Um, and, and I think the reason we get there is because that's kind of the position we're in. I would submit to you that if tomorrow we could say, kind of as was the goal of this fund, that we'll, we want to give you $5 million, it'll just go to police salaries or something of that sort, but maybe not necessarily increase some of the other items that perhaps the electeds are less interested in, we'll take that deal. Indeed, that was the genesis, I think, of what this fund is. Is there a way to ever truly get to that? So if I Yes. I, I think oh. one of the one of the issues that happened this year is that and I, I I'm not gonna speak about past years because I wasn't in this position, but city council is from what I understand it didn't get to see the budget that we submitted to city finance. They saw it after uh, city finance massage. Is that correct? Um, so but let me say with respect, and I apologize, Madam Chair, finance does that to everyone's budget. Oh, 100%. Right, right. Oh, it's, it, they do that to everybody. Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is they, they will take every director, if they're doing their yes. job, says, I want this. Finance's job is to, in some yes. way, even it up. Go ahead. Yes, and, and, and if I um, gave the impression they only do that to police, that's, sure. that's wholeheartedly, I know, that that that's not and i also know that um i don't know any department correct me if i'm wrong gets everything that they ask for <laughs> so um i do know that but um i think part of you know making sure that that we talk more about our budget that we work more collaboratively that we provide the city council and city finance with with the budget that that we submit to the board that that, that you all approved to, to be presented to um city finance that that our city council sees that first before it goes over and then all the assessments are made um there were some assessments and some categories to our budget this year that um were in deficit like to, to start out in a deficit so so working from a minus um was a bit of a challenge which also resulted in some of the transfers so i so i truly think that i truly believe that uh if we can come together and work on that budget um we're going to have some needs that, that we want that I know that there's going to be some like some assessments that, you know, we don't have this, but you can have this just like what you said. Um, but we need to work on that together to where it's we, we're not having this conversation. And with with all of these um, these transfers every board session and having this conversation about we were assessed this much money in contractual service. So we're, we're moving this money to pay for um, whatever. Yeah, I want nothing more than more of a transparent process. And also, um, executive services and myself have the every intent to go out to the public and offer public events where we're talking about our budget. This is what we're requesting. This is what it looks like um, and why. And we know, like, I don't know. Do you ever remember a year that we've gotten everything that we've asked for? Because I don't, <laughs> that would be a great year. Um, <laughs> might be down the record books, so. I add one thing. Um, it, it's my understanding, though, that that when we we do these movement of, of funds, um, because we had a long conversation at the um, well, the May uh, May board meeting when we had to do our budget transfers, we typically will do a, a large transfer. Um, but the concern that that we had discussed was if we did 
let's say $8 million out of personal services, then we were afraid that we wouldn't have the funds in there to um, pay for the, the raises that we promised, the step increases and higher in the academy classes. So we opted to do these monthly transfers and go uh, pay as we go, if you will, to the um, um, contractual services so that we could continue to hire and ensure that our members got raises until we got to a point that we were drawing that down and then have continued discussions with the city. Um, but I think what we do with these transfers is, is no different than what other city departments do. The only difference is we have to come to the board to do these transfers in a public forum where it's my understanding other city departments just have to go to their finance department and it never goes um, to the city council. Like I could be wrong, but that's my understanding of the process. Um, so that goes back to the transparency here. We are doing this in an open forum, asking for permission from the board. So I just, I just want to put that out there. Any more, Mayor? I, I could go for hours, but I, this is this is sufficient. I think we understand where where we all are. Let Anyone else have about questions? Officers, though, um, and I do want to. I'm make sorry. Sure what did you say about officers? Okay. Um, and there was that note um, because in the a big part of the fund, and I've lost the slide, but it it doesn't necessarily. We don't need it. Um, was that that top line item? of roughly, I forget how much it was, would go to hiring of 88 additional officers um, or something of that sort. And um, have we been able to fulfill that metric? Sorry, to, um, have we been able to fulfill that metric? You, oh, you got it, the answer. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to help her uh, <laughs> with the numbers because there's a lot of numbers being thrown out, right? And I think if you go back to that slide, you look, the last class that's in there right now was part of that which is the 20, I think there's 24 in that class now. So they only, against that number, they came in in whatever it was, April. Mm -hmm. So they only, against that budget, was April one month to get to that 88. If you remember, if you, all the way back, we said we we're going to have four academy classes. We tried to spread those out, um, which we did. And then that last class was really our biggest class. So that last class didn't go against that budget. As much as it would have, it would have been great if we'd had 26 or whatever, 24 in May of the previous mm -hmm. year, but that's when the hiring process has started changing. So to, to ensure I understand what you're, you're noting for us is it's kind of a timing issue. Everybody was talking about have all these new officers in February and March, but the class actually starts several weeks after that point, but before the new budget year starts. Right. And so then while it doesn't count as a post May one, this still is the number that when we were all chatting about it, we were looking to hit. Well, we surpassed that number, didn't we, Doug? The 88, where we got the 103? Oh, thank you. That's all, Madam Chair, for me. Any other questions from the board? I don't know that I have a question, but I would certainly, and I think perhaps I'm covering plowed ground here, but um, the iterative process seems to be critically important. And maybe that's what you're referring to from years ago and finding the right venue and forum for that, whether it's with city finance or with council members, but in some way moving that upstream. So it's earlier in the process before council approves the budget. So that there is, I think you said this chief, a greater likelihood that there's better alignment, realizing that we will probably never have 100% alignment on every line item, but that tension can be healthy because it can produce clarity around matters that may not be well understood and the intentions behind what the department is recommending in its budget. So looking for that right venue, I think, is what we would um, encourage so that we can move those conversations up and have an iterative process. Well said. Okay. Colonel Spot on. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Doug Jones for providing this audit. I think it, it opened our eyes to a lot of things, and there's a lot of room here for us to, uh, to grow and work on our process. Um, he and his team, they've been outstanding to work with. Um, 
going back and looking at the first quarter to where we are now, I mean, it, it's, it's night and day. There was a lot of hurdles to get over, a lot of bumps in the road. Um, but I thank you and your team, Doug. Um, and uh, Acting Major Josh Heinen, Budget Manager Christine Ryder, Assistant Supervisor Melissa McLaughlin, and Fiscal Administrator Sean Cawthon, they they carry the bulk of the load on our end, uh, put in over 360 hours just to make sure we met these benchmarks and we got the um, data collected and provided to the city in a timely manner. So I just want to put it out there and thank them publicly. Deputy Chief, thank you. Uh, we enjoyed working with you and your staff. I also want to thank the Chief for responding much faster than she was required to. That helped us get this audit to you today. It actually was not due until today or Wednesday because of the 30 days. So thank you. Thank all of your staff for working with us. And uh, we'll just have to get the next audit scheduled for something entirely different. So thank you all. And Madam, thank you. I appreciate the, oh, I'm sorry. And Madam okay. Chair, if I may commend and join this moment, I know you all only get to hear our questions that may seem um, negative towards you potentially, although I know you're a professional and understand it. Um, uh, to the city auditor's point, over the years, I've worked with a number of directors and departments. Fortunately, many are gone now, uh, but who did not commit to this level of transparency of responsiveness. We've had back and forth over the years with water directors, public works directors, and others who were rather resistant to any type of change or introspection as to how we could better deliver services to taxpayers and provide information like this. So just the responsiveness does matter to us and is appreciated. And I think on behalf of city council, I would say that for you. And thank you, auditor, for letting us uh, kind of take and partake in that conversation. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you do more of that so that we cannot have that big difference in the budget this year. Any other questions? All right, then the next is the mayor's designee. Our regular designee will be Councilman Crispin Rea, uh, the fourth district at large councilman in Kansas City, former prosecutor for a number of years and school board member and father of a very young child, by the way. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you, good morning. Um, a teething child, I should add. <laughs> uh, so I'm, all, I'm sure you all could imagine. Um, good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Crispin Ray. I recently elected to represent the fourth district at large. Um, I will be giving the regular updates per the mayor's request. And so I just want to take a moment and tell you a little bit about my background um, as we continue to have conversations about what the city council is doing. Um, as the mayor mentioned, I am most previously uh, served as a prosecuting attorney in uh, Jackson County Prosecutor's Office and Special Victims Unit. Served in the office for eight years, uh, six years in SVU. Prior to that, uh, I served on the school board for Kansas City Public Schools. Uh, I am a volunteer uh, board member for the Police Athletic League uh, for the center over at uh, 18th and White, which I actually grew up right down the street from uh, and attended programming there. I've had experience working in the mayor's office uh, at the Maddie Road Center. Um, and now serving as a council member uh, to represent the 4th District. It's a couple items I want to give you an update on uh, and then happy to entertain any questions you might have. Um, one issue that is uh, timely and important is uh, city's decision on how to move forward on a detention and rehabilitation center. Um, on, some, on September 6th at a special council session, uh, the mayor and council agreed that our best path forward on that issue uh, would be for the city to not join the county in creating a joint facility or shared facility. Uh, and we decided the best way to move forward was to establish a special council committee to do the work and make recommendations to the full council. And so that has happened on September 20th. The mayor um, uh, uh, made the appointments to that committee and I am actually going to be chairing that committee. There are, I'd say about four specific questions uh, that the committee needs to make recommendations uh, in regards to. One is the size of the facility. How many beds are we talking? Uh, the nature of those beds. So what's the ratio between detention and uh, mental health programming we're looking to do? Uh, how we are going to finance this facility and its location. And that's, those are the four areas that this committee is gonna work over the coming months to make recommendations to the full council. Um, our goal is to be 
uh, complete with that work by the end of January. And we will be having uh, regular weekly meetings when we have council session that week, Tuesday afternoons at 2.30. Our first meeting will be this Tuesday, uh, this afternoon at 2.30. And um, the, the meetings and format, I would probably better call better to call them hearings, will look very similar to what we have with our business uh, council sessions where we have experts, stakeholders, presenters come in, present information to the council, and then we are able to ask questions and engage in conversation and, and learn more. And so uh, I believe we have about 11 sessions that we'll be able to hold where we will have stakeholders. Certainly we'll extend an invitation to Chief Graves and any staff who uh, she would uh, uh, identify as appropriate to come and talk to the council. Um, and uh, simultaneous to that, we will also be hosting public community engagement forums, one in each council district um, in partnership with the council members that represent those districts. And so uh, we don't have those scheduled. That will be a topic of conversation for our first meeting today. We don't have a presenter for our first meeting today. Uh, it's mostly to discuss our goals and, and calendar moving forward and then um, in October, we will be having presenters come and talk. And so um, I, I, it, it's, it's going to be a lot of work. I'm looking forward to the conversation. You know, it's not an issue where we need to go back to the consultants and we need another study. We have a study that was completed in 2019, uh, but we need to uh, provide ourselves with a lot of information to make a, uh, a measured and reasonable decision on, on this issue. Um, and so I'm looking forward to hearing from Chief Graves and staff um, on their end on what they think is important, as well as a whole long list of other stakeholders. Uh, another issue that uh, I'd like to update you on is we have invited Chief Graves uh, and Dr. Ken Novak to make a presentation on focused deterrence uh, before the city council on October 5th at a business uh, council business session. Um, you know, the goal, uh, and I, I did extend the invitation to, to Dr. Novak to, to make that presentation with the goal being educating the council um, on this public safety strategy and what role, if any, we as a city can play uh, moving forward. I failed to mention that uh, prior to working uh, as an assistant prosecuting attorney, I did work in the prosecutor's office for about seven years uh, as a case manager in the Casey Nova program. Uh, which was our previous uh, version of, of focus deterrence that we saw incredible success with. And so um, it is a, a public safety strategy that I am uh, intimately familiar with uh, that I believe holds a lot of promise. And so I'm looking forward to that information being presented to uh, the rest of my colleagues. I was uh, present for a, a prior presentation on uh, risk train modeling and, and um, that type of data driven policing. Um, you know, that is a uh, strategy that has linked up with the multiple, uh, multi multidisciplinary task force that the mayor's office has created in conjunction with city staff. Um, I had a, a neighborhood issue in the fourth district where we had kind of a nexus of criminal activity between two businesses that was crossing Broadway. Neighbors had made a lot of complaints about it. There was loitering, there was drug activity going on, there were some other things. Um, and so I was able to call upon this effort uh, both KCPD participated along with uh, the multidisciplinary side of things. And um, these folks went in very quickly, identified the issues, met with the community folks around there and started talking solutions. And I think that's how that's supposed to work. And I can tell you that as a council member, when I identify these uh, hotspots, these nexus locations of criminal activity, uh, it's a great resource to be able to call on. And so um, uh, I, I've encouraged other council members to do so as well. And you know, again, if there's a way we can be supportive of those efforts on the city side, we'll, we'll be looking out for that. And so that was all I had to cover today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. On the jail site, have you all identified any possible location yet? Uh, did you say location? Yes. Have you yeah. identified possible locations? I think that's, um, that is a question we need to make a recommendation on. Um, you know, we currently do own uh, a sizable piece of the land uh, at the location where the, the current Jackson County detention facility is being built. Um, I believe it's in a floodplain, and so it's going to take, uh, I think we got to raise it about seven or 10 feet. Um, but we do currently have that land. I believe this is an issue that is on the table for discussion, and we 
very well might, you know, identify that as our best opportunity moving forward. But um, that's a question we'll be looking at answering uh, with the, 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 the benefit of having that land available uh, to begin the discussion. In terms of the timing on this, as you noted, you had the city council had a report four years ago with recommendations. When are we likely to get a new jail? Um, part of Casey Nova's impact was due to the consequences that people didn't comply with the uh, requirements uh, and then they would go to jail. We don't, we're really struggling right now to put people behind bars because there aren't enough beds. When are we going to be able to get more beds? There's a couple of things I'd like to address with that um, comment, because I want to make sure that this committee operates um, within the proper framework for the public to view. Um, you know, the, the, the type of offender that's going to be um, wrapped up in a focused deterrence Nova like network is going to be a, a fairly serious violent offender, someone that's most likely going to be housed at the Jackson County Detention Center, someone that's going to be most likely to face felony and state level charges. Um, we need to be very clear with folks as we are talking about this jail at the municipal level. You know, this is this is not going to be the place where we're holding the murderers and the rapists and the most violent of the violent, the highest level felony offenders. Um, we are going to be holding folks that uh, KCPD is picking up uh, for trespassing, for thefts, auto thefts, for property damages, for uh, should be low level assaults that often don't result in an injury, strangulation or involve a weapon. And so um, I, 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 I I just want to be clear on that point, because as we work to re-implement a focused deterrence approach, I think the strongest detention component there is the Jackson County Jail, not necessarily uh, what we will do at the, the municipal level. I'm sure it'll play a role, but um, um, we're, we're talking about a very different kind of offender that we will be holding in a municipal jail. Um, as to the, the timeline, I can tell you, uh, uh, every single council member and the mayor wants to work very quickly on this. Um, you know, my hope is that over the coming months, we'll have that recommendation by the end of January, maybe before, hopefully before that point. Um, and then we'll have to get to work and, and figuring out how we do this thing. Um, you know, there is uh, the world cup on the horizon, which is going to bring a lot of folks to Kansas city, um, for an extended period of time. And I have that in the back of my mind as, um, uh, an informal deadline that we need to have something functioning. But of course, there are a lot of factors that, that play into, you know, a specific timeline. What I can say is that we want to move as quickly as we can. If, if I may volunteer just a very brief answer to it, there is some art to the um, time frame of the committee. Councilman Ray is directed to have the committee come up with a final recommendation by uh, January, the goal being that it precedes the budget discussion. January is important for a few different reasons. January also is the time at which there's a deadline to put something on the ballot in April. So um, looking at the question of how something like this would be funded, either, right, you just create a debt obligation and you start putting that into the budget, which is submitted in mid-February, or you would look to have something that's submitted to the taxpayers for a vote by what is the third city council meeting in January. Of course, as early as they can be in that process would be helpful. But that's that's kind of to Mr. Kenner's question, um, not speaking of the prior four years, but that's the goal now of a fairly pinpointed and, and quick and efficient review process. I just have one thing. I um, First, I want to thank you, uh, Mayor, for continuing to push this. I know this is a, a new a new council. I, I, I appreciate the new council coming in and having like the, the set date of, of January 2024. I appreciate the urgency of, of the rehabilitation and detention center and that the need that that's recognized and it with a, such a short timeline on a new council coming in. So I just, I just want to say thank you for that. Um, to your point, Mr. Kenner, when the, I think the offenders that you're talking about are also those who are being arrested for city assault, sometimes our domestic violence assaults, um, 
those are some of the people that that do face some of the um, the city charges, and that's a, the the city level offenses. It also includes some of those that are um, the nonviolent offenders um, that are. Um, that our business owners here in Kansas City are are faced with some of those challenges and um, a lack of of a a rehabilitation and detention center here specifically for Kansas City. Um, part of the benefit of also having uh, such a facility is that some of these offenders are in crisis, which. Um, I know we have like a mental health court. We have all kinds of different specialty courts over at, over at municipal court. This is one uh, conduit uh, to bring some of those offenders who are in crisis almost to like force them into services uh, that they may not have on their own been able to uh, make their way to, or if they were, they were resistant to it. So I, I think this is, is a, a benefit to our city either way. I know sometimes like the jail conversation is not um, a popular uh, decision, but I will tell you that the community meetings that I'm in, people want, people want this facility. People see the need and they see see the value of it. Um, and you know, it's not not long term, but some people just need. I, I've said this in a couple community meetings. Some people just need a timeout. Mm -hmm. um, and some of your business owners and and people that are experiencing the other side of this as as victims really want this. In fact, I had someone at, I, I, I spoke at a, a listening session last night at Central Middle School. And while I, I, I kind of chuckled, the man was serious. He said, um, hey, <laughs> keep going for the, uh, we, we want a city jail more than we want like a, a stadium. So like it was <laughs> like, we kind of chuckled, but he was dead serious. But I just want to want you to know that, that you know, that our officers see and hear uh, people of Kansas City. And that's that's what the one is. So, again, thank you for pushing on the gas, especially with the new council. And um, I also appreciate all the engagement that in the conversation that we've had. And I, I wholeheartedly look forward to uh, a new uh, folks deterrence model, like formalizing it. We're doing it in, in, in uh, informal processes here and there. We're already doing some of those pieces. But to have that formal process. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your willingness to be such a big part of that. Unfortunately, I will be on a business trip on October 5th. So um, Deputy Chief Mabin will be, be standing in for me. But he is also the person who's been tasked with um, getting that all together and reforming that here at KCPD. Thank you very much. We look thank forward you. to seeing you every month. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. congratulations. Chief? Yes, I think I'll just, uh, if I could bring up Josh, uh, acting Major Heinen, I just, while we're talking about the budget, I'm just going to stay on that roll for like about five more minutes. Um, I just want to reiterate some of the things that we said earlier. You know, we are down approximately 300 officers, I think, is our number 1099 right now, Doug. Uh, you know, full strength, we're uh, 1,408. And compared to our 2020 staffing level of 1,400, you can imagine how much more of an impact that many officers uh, would make. Um, so with that many officers down, we're also down professional staff. So if you if you look at that, we're understaffed in almost every area of the police department. Uh, and we're still losing officers faster than we can hire them. I, I want to commend uh, our admin bureau for getting uh, 103 more officers through the academy. But, uh, you know, it's... It, it, we're still living in what I hope to be that tail end of, of the perfect storm where we had that cops grant 25 years ago. And, and there's such a, a hiring push that, that some of those are officers are coming to their retirement. But anyway, um, KCP, one of the challenges is, and I talked about this at the last board meeting is um, we, we used to be the highest paying agency in the region. We are the largest law enforcement agency in the state of Missouri. Uh, we routinely filled academy classes uh, and we recruited from our regional areas like Omaha, Nebraska, Des Moines, Iowa. Um, but we're no longer the highest paying law enforcement agency in the region. In fact, um, I don't think we're even second or third, but I think you're, you're going to present on that. So in October or, or here soon, we will be presenting the board a budget for obviously submission to the, to the city and part of that ever increasing costs 
of materials from a police department, I'll be asking for additional funds to raise the starting pay of a police officer to 60000 here at KCPD. Uh, this ask will also fund raising the pay for all law enforcement and professional staff employees. Part of that that's given us the ability to do that was Governor Parson signing SB 186 that uh, that removed that 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 pay limit that we had. And I know that wasn't the right term to say for that, but but you guys know what I mean. Uh, so we need to attract and keep the employees that we have already invested so much in, and this would be the bottom amount to keep KCPD competitive. Um, so if you want to take it over, Josh, appreciate you it. Um, I'm Josh Heinen. I'm the acting commander over the fiscal division. And because everyone loves talking about numbers and budget as much as I do, we thought we'd just keep rolling into it with today's meeting. Um, as you know, the budget season is upon us. The city has requested our budget submission by October 20th. Um, so we want to get that to board members as soon as we possibly can and we are actively working on that right now um, and then we are going to ask to hopefully get a special session in between now and then so that we have a dedicated board meeting specifically to that important piece of our policing abilities here and gives everybody an opportunity to ask questions specifically about that well we're going to have to because the next meeting is the 31st which is after the city wants the budget Correct. so we'll find a new date yep. Right. Thank you. I was going to Additional mention that. Additional yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we get into that, we just wanted to um, present a little bit about what it's going to look like and what our priority is coming into this budget. Um, the priority, just like the chief said, um, of the organization and of the fiscal division is to get our officers to a starting pay of $60,000 a year coming into the door to make that competitive with the other regional and statewide regional state agencies in our area. And so I'm gonna show some statistics here to where we're at now and where we hope to be coming up. I'm sure most of you have seen this slide or something very similar to it. Um, it's in our budget book. Um, this is just to show a breakdown of what our budget goes to. And you'll see here that most of our budget goes to personnel services. That's the cost of, of our people, the most important part of our organization here. One thing you will note. Uh, Acting Major, is there, do we have this presentation in the board book? It is not in the board no. book, no. It, sorry about that, sir. That's what, if you could circulate it to us. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, so what you'll see here is that that 84.8% is the breakdown of that personnel cost. However, some of our personnel cost is also in the contractual services category. We break it down in the category so it's consistent with how the city does their budgeting. And so some of that personnel cost is broke down in the contractual services. The overall percentage of our budget going to personnel is 91.1%, I think is somewhere around there. So this is where we're at now. Um, this is trend lines over the last three years. We started at 2019. Um, at 2019, I think we ended in August of 2019, we had 1,314 officers going from 2019 into 2020. And at that point, between COVID and the different movements that occurred in 2020, this is the trend line over the last three years. And you can see from here, um, the massive staffing level decrease that has occurred and as well as how that affects or potentially affects all of those other lines. Our response time in that period has gone up. The calls for service per officer, the workload per officer has gone up during that period. And as well as the, the part one crimes in Kansas City have gone up during that period. And this is why we are kind of at a pivotal point in this organization. We cannot allow these trend lines to continue. We have to do something now to try to correct this. Um, we feel like as an organization, we need to do everything we can to provide a better service to the community um, and, and get these trend lines back in the right direction. 
So this is where we're currently at. You can see at the bottom there, this is starting pay coming in the door of the regional agencies. So at the bottom is where we're at, where we at, and then the proposed toward the top is where we hope to be. We fully understand that the city has a finite amount of funds and we're not gonna try to ask for the world. We wanna be good partners with the city. Um, and so we're not trying to get to the very top, but we have to be competitive. Our employment unit, our admin bureau, I know is working hard out there in recruiting, going to the, the college recruitment fairs, to the military organizations, even to different high schools. And they're still selling us as a premier agency, but we're, we're kind of handcuffed here when we're going in there and these people coming straight out of college, what do they want to know? They want to know, what am I going to make? How much money am I making coming in the door? And this is, this is what we have to tell them, unfortunately, and we have to do better. It really puts us behind when we're going, and this is the number we have to present. And so this is going to be our ask. Um, you can see there from the salary standpoint, it's not a massive increase to get our officers coming in the door at $60,000 a year. There is effects across the whole pay scale. You move the bottom step up, it moves the next step up, moves the next step up. Um, you know, that's... It's, pretty easy to understand at that point, but we have to get to that point where we can bring them in the door to be competitive with our regional agencies. You can see a lot of this cost on the overall personnel costs, a lot of it going up is due to pension. And that's a cost we have no control over. They have a, it's a state mandate. They get an actuarial done on the pension. I think they presented, Mayor, they presented to you and the city council on their projection of what they're going to do. And so, I mean, that's a $10 million increase. That eats, eats up a lot of this. The overall salary increase is not that much in comparison. And so it's something I think that we can work with the city. And like Doug said, to increase our transparency and have these conversations ahead of time. And this is something that we can get done and we need to get done. I'll take any questions if you have them. I have no question. I agree. This needs to be done and I'm glad you're working on it. Any other comments? I would just like to say thank you for providing that information. Um, again, I've been hearing being out in the business community um, how important it is to have the officers to be out there and, and responding as well as with violent crimes. Um, and I know, as I've said, you know, I, I look at risk versus reward in my world and I look at that in this too, because Kansas City, we've got some of the highest violent crime rates right now, which we're working on. And to me, that's, you know, taking a huge risk. Officers, you know, nowadays, I, I understand the anxiety with our officers because you're going out in these communities and, you know, it's, it's scary. And so I agree, we really need 60,000 is not much. And we need to do everything we can to make that happen, to get those numbers up, because I think that's what's really hurting our recruiting out there is we don't have that right now. And at least if we show we're at the top of the level and we are, you know, getting paid for taking that risk a little bit more, I think that will help with uh, getting people to come on board with us as well. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, so this will be part of what you're going to present a budget to us. Yes, ma'am. Quickly. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Do you have a timeline on that, Chief? We hope to have the, the budget to you this week, by the end of this week. Okay. So you'll deliver hard copies to us? Yes. The end of this week, if we want them. If we don't, we can have them on the computer. And then we'll talk about scheduling a meeting next week. Okay. Okay. Um, First, I, I apologize for not making this slide available. Um, this is kind of a, like a last minute ask. I'm like, hey, this is what I'm going to talk about. Can you make a slide? <laughs> so apologies for not giving you that in advance. Um, this, is a, um, this is an important time in our city, in our police department. Part of the success in my eyes for me in this position is to make sure that our members feel valued and supported both internally and externally. Our pay um, for being the largest region and the risk that our officers take, we should be the highest paid 
in, in, in the area to attract one quality candidates, but also show value in the work that the men and women of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department do every day. Why I say this is so important now is because the critical staffing levels that we're at, we wholeheartedly need to keep the people that we have here, that we have so much invested in that choose to serve every day, but then also attract um, other quality candidates to come and work for Kansas City, Missouri Police Department to really be those those uh, change makers here for our city. So we have a lot of things, a lot of exciting things happening, a lot of things on the horizon. Um, so I, th this is the time. This is the time to, to, to start this. We have the opportunity to do this with, with the SB 186. We've got to decide like what our police department's going to look like. We're convinced. We want to keep right, the people you. we have and get more good people. So get the budget to us and we'll work on it. And work with the city. Madam okay. Chair. Yes. Uh, to that point, if I may, uh, first of all, I want to say I, I commend um, you on this request. One of the small points of pride I've had in, in public life is that we've seen increases in most city departments and good ones in a number of them over the last several years in salaries. And I think that does make a difference at the end of the day, um, forecasting how the discussion will go. And I think you understand this. To the extent that this is a discussion on salaries and attracting people, I think what we would say is we're all in um, on the elected official side. What that might mean, however, is though in the other budget categories that are not personnel related, if you propose the exact same percentage increases in those areas, then perhaps you'll have more conflict. And I think in some ways, the core of our discussion with the auditor was this, that it's been my view as somebody who's voted on eight police budgets so far that we always actually want to fund people more than anything. Hell, people vote for us, right? Um, contracts don't. And so as we have this discussion, I think many of us are very comfortable to say we like good competitive salaries. Frankly, in every Kansas City department, I would like our folks to be the best paid possible, no matter the position and the area. Uh, but to what extent can we find cost savings in some of the other areas? Because I think where sometimes we get into our issue is, unless council appropriates the entire corpus of your request, then it seems like it's a cut that unfortunately seems to consistently impact our people. And I understand the acting major's point that people is a big part of it, don't get me wrong. But again, that's something for every department as well. And so as we have our discussions uh, that follow this discussion, I'd like us to be mindful <coughs> of that and look to where there may be potential cost savings as we talk about every year in some of the other areas, contractual services and beyond, so that we can get better funding to our people. And I think some of, some of the challenge this year was just like some of those contractual services, just uh, it coming over in deficit. So yeah. I think that us all working together, coming together for an amicable process, a transparent process, I think <clears> we're <throat> going to get where we need to be. Well, at least mm -hmm. we're going to get somewhere. We'll get us closer. And, and, closer. and I will say right. this, and I think your point was absolutely accurate. Um, I talk occasionally about the soldier nephew and the Marine nephew. So the Marine's almost done. So I've, I've told them, hey, you should think about coming into this. And, and to your points, all of you have shared this with me over time. He's like, well, I can get offered this, at, you know, some distribution type thing and live this very different life. And I'm saying, but the pension and the everything else, and, you know, it's just a little different perhaps for, for some now. And I think salary makes a huge difference in terms of someone saying, all right, at least this department and this community will believe in me which helps us get part of the way um, to where we need to be. Madam Chair, let me sure. make one point because as I've looked at these budgets over six years, we continue to subsidize all these other agencies around us because we have a price that we say, here's what we charge. And if we charge more, they're gonna go somewhere else. Well, not necessarily true because since we have the best training facility, you know, costs go up on everything. So we cannot continue to subsidize these other agencies and then say, oh, they're paying more than us. Well, and they take our people. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so it, you, you can't have one without looking at the other. Now, let me make a very trivial point here. Uh, Gates Barbecue, which I love, their little potato salad used to be 
They went up to 350. I keep buying it because it's the best in town. <laughs> so since we are the best in town, we have got to look at those costs and charge what it costs. And I guarantee you, they're going to grumble. They're going to gripe like I do at Gates, but I keep buying it. So um, we can't talk about this, this one thing and not view the other and make them both right. Point taken. And in fact, that actually, the you mentioned that at the last board meeting, Absolutely. that has sparked conversation and us reviewing that. So um, we were, we are prepared to discuss that, but just so you know, that, that, that's something that we've, we've been talking about and looking at and reviewing. Well, and I'd like to say too, on being proactive with that, is we really do need to be proactive now and presenting this because I don't want to see us as a business community of the next Seattle. And I know, you know, with the crime downtown Seattle, they are offering their officers 30,000 to come on because they can't get anybody. And I don't want to see it progress to that. I want to be in front of that. And with the business community and getting our officers out there and people feeling safe in this community. So I feel it's very important that we are very proactive and working on this. Any other? One last thing. All it's right. not on the budget. Thank you, Josh. Um, if I could have Miss Annette Green come up and um, Intern Officer Ariel Brittenall. Uh, Ms. Green is an Administrative Assistant 3 at Metro Patrol Division. She's a legend. Everybody knows her. Come on, Ms. Green. How are you this morning? <laughs> if you guys just come to the podium, please. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think Ariel had to leave. She's actually in the academy right now. But for almost a year, as you guys know, we've been hiring recruits prior in bringing them on and putting them in different places uh, around the police department before their academy class starts. Um, so intern officer Brittenall was assigned to Metro Patrol before starting the academy where she met Miss Green. Uh, Miss Green, like I said, everybody knows you, Miss Green. I appreciate for what you do. And how long have you been up at the police department? 24 years. 24 years. Uh, and you're, you're always a help to everyone. So Miss Green taught intern officer Brittenall and Mujica, Mujica, mm -hmm. yes, uh, how to write police reports. Uh, recently, while in report writing training at the academy, Officer Brittenall reached out to Miss Green. She thanked Miss Green for training them so well. And uh, Officer Brittenall even said that she feels prepared way ahead of her training and her classmates. In fact, we checked and she has had almost perfect scores on all of her reports and helps her fellow classmates with their reports. Uh, and she also gives Miss Green all the credit for that. So thank you, Miss Green, for making such an impact on a young tenured intern officer. Uh, thank you for preparing her to be a future police officer. And let this be a reminder to others that you never know what kind of impact you would have on someone by sharing your knowledge and your time, just even devoting a, a little bit of your time to helping someone. So Miss Green, as a token of my appreciation, I would like to present you with the Chief's Coin. Congratulations and thank you. That, Ms. Green, that is exactly what we hoped would happen when we started hiring people before they went to the academy, is that they would learn more and it would be easier for them in the academy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> well, I should say, Colonel Niemeyer, you've done a good job of finding places to put those folks, and I appreciate that. Okay, Colonel Ortiz. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. My information is under tab B on your books. On the following pages, you will find the daily homicide analysis report with some information. 
In 2023, we had 144 homicides from 135 incidents. <clears throat> this year, we clear, successfully clear 68 homicides, 31 homicides from previous years for a total of 99 cases. 69% of the homicides that occurred in 2023 have been cleared or solved. In August, we had 16 homicides. Out of those 16, four are cleared. Three of them were charged and one is declined because of self-defense. We still have four cases that are solved and we're waiting for the prosecutors to review it to give us an answer on that. Which means you think it's solved but the prosecutors haven't agreed. Correct. Thank you. They have all the information that-, that I understand. It, correct. And we still have eight cases that we continue working for the month of August. <laughs> I also have a breakdown of the August homicides by division. As you can see, three of them happened in Central Patrol Division, four in Metro, seven in East, one in North, one South, and none in Shoal Creek Patrol. In August, arguments were the primary cause of homicides with six. One was due to drugs, and two were due to self-defense, and the remaining seven are still unknown that we continue investigating. So far, there have been 10 homicide victims in September. That's the same, exactly the same as 10 from last year by this time. Out of the 10 homicides that we had this year, two are due to domestic violence. You also have a copy of the known fatal shooting comparison report. You will find that from January 1st to September 26th, we had 375 known fatal shooting victims. In 2022, we had 402. We had 402 victims during the same time period, which is down 7% compared to last year. In August 2023, we had 49 known fatal shooting victims compared to 61 of August of the previous year. That's an 18% decrease, decrease for the month. Of those 49 cases that we have, that we had the previous month, eight suspects have been charged. 13 of those cases continue to be active, active cases. Six cases are pending labs. Four cases are closed because of uncooperative victims. We still have some other cases that will continue working, even though some of the victims don't want to co cooperate with us. We're seeking all the charges for those cases. So far, there have been 36 non-fatal shooting victims in September compared to 44 at the same time last year. I want to extend my gratitude to also the detectives of the assault squad they respond to 80 to 90% of our known fatal shootings. When we compare those numbers to other cities across the country, we realize that other cities are responding to 25 to 30%. So 80 to 90% response is incredible. And it just shows the commitment that our department has from our professional staff to our detectives. And we appreciate the work that they're doing. So you're saying in other places, there's a non-fatal shooting and officers don't respond at all? Detectives. Detectives, oh, detectives. don't respond. Okay. Those. Yes. And they only respond to 25 to 30 percent. Okay. Is that major cities chiefs that gives you that number or what's the, where does that come from? And some of the numbers come from Denver police, for example, Phoenix and other cities that are comparable in size to ours. I, I, there's some there's some cities that that do respond, and there's some that 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 don't respond to all non-fatal shootings. So I think that he's just making that comparison with some that that they don't respond to as many as we do. I'm not sure exactly which cities. That's that's correct. Yeah. Madam Chair. Yes. I may just have a few questions, and at some point I'll ask us maybe to do something different. The city council actually, the new city council has taught me some new things. We had a work session the other day about broad-based budgeting priorities, for example, uh, which was helpful because it was about eight hours of us actually <coughs> talking about how things work. And I gained a lot from that. Here, uh, every month I ask you, and I'm going to ask you again, of course, uh, but 
um, maybe we want to think more about something like the the strong trend of a decline in non-fatal shootings in this city, with the exception of the aberration of February, which was quite one. Um, this has been a year where, for the most part, things have trended down. And I always kind of wonder why. What's what's the reason? I understand it's it's our department's good work. Is it that perhaps federal operations that have incarcerated more folks contribute to that? What's kind of the story behind it? So, of course, we can do more about it. Because as you heard in the jail conversation, we know broad strokes and we know a few things, right? Jail bit spaces, number of officers and beyond. I'd like to know how all of these things are working together to get us to that safer city that Commissioner Kramer was talking about, because despite the comment, we're more violent than Seattle, actually, by far. And so I'd like us to continue to kind of move forward on how we can get there. Go ahead. If I could respond to that. Sorry, do you mind if I? No, go Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I think violent crime is such a complex issue, and there's so many things that go into it. I don't think you can point to just one, but, um, you know, that a little bit of what Councilman Ray talked about is that citywide approach to violent crime that, that we've been talking about, that we work together, that multidisciplinary task force that you set up in, in your office to include partners for peace. Uh, we've been we've been out there in different spaces than we have been in the past uh, and and more so. And we continue to do that. Even some of these these areas that we've identified where we have brought in city services like, uh, you know, I can I'm specifically thinking of two areas of our city where we had um, shots fired, homicides, where we converge on that area with that multidisciplinary approach, with that citywide approach. But in addition to that, um, without speaking too specifically about them, just because they're in a. In, in, in federal court, uh, we are that we have had several federal investigations that we have worked with our partners on. Um, yeah, so, so when you you mentioned, you know, is this our federal partners? You know, it, it's all of these things together. Everyone um, working in different, whether it be the enforcement, the prevention, the intervention. I always am cautious. <laughs> to take credit for a lower percentage. Um, so it, it's it's hard to just put that on one specific category, but I think it's just, violent crime is so complex. I think it's just a, a multi-faceted approach. Well, I appreciate um, that work and, and I see you chomping in the bid too, Colonel, but uh, I will encourage you to continue to share at least what you think are, are contributing factors for that. Um, unrelated to your budget, right? The city budget's a $2 billion document each year. Probably will be a little more than that this year. And so knowing where our investments will be worthwhile so that we can continue to work cooperatively with the police department and other stakeholders will be key. Uh, I'll make one point relating to that. And I wish I would have had this actually for the jail discussion. I asked the health department some time ago for um, overdose death statistics, given our many drug issues. And in the same way that our homicides have increased precipitously over the last four years, we went from 100 overdose deaths in 2019 to 136 in 2020, 182 in 2021, which is the last year that I have data for, because I guess they're still figuring out everything with 2022. So it does seem that, and this is where I would love the help from you, and I know we have a fentanyl presentation coming up, is... Where are these other areas? Where's this other work and investment we should be doing that ultimately helps drop all of these numbers? Because I, I have to think the, the drugs have something to do with, you know, the, the shootings and the homicides, and hopefully we get somewhere on that. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And something else that we're noticing, gradually we can see a shift in the community, the support that we're getting from the community. Most of this information and solving these cases, I know that it says 69 to 70% of those cases that we're solving and clearing. Compared to this, the national standards, it's way below 50%. So we're about 20% above the average. And it wouldn't be possible without the support that we're seeing, the incredible support that we're seeing from our community members cooperating with us. That could be another contributor factor to that. Any more questions about that? Well, along those lines, I was talking to one of our community members today who 
said, you know, again, what a great job you guys are doing and how much he appreciated it. And I know we've been working or just did a, a big uh, bust with ATF. And that was huge in letting people know that, you know what, we are doing this and, and taking us a little more serious. So I appreciate all the hard work that uh, we did with them to, to make that happen. And it is noted in the community and they are seeing that, so. Thank you. Yes, our federal partners are being crucial with us or for the support that we get from them. It's incredible. So we're grateful to have them also working with us. All right, we're gonna move on. Black males accounted for the highest number of non-federal shooting victims with 29, accounting for 59%. White males were second with 15 victims or 31%. Black females were the remaining five victims or 10%. We identified 12 suspects. Eight of the suspects were black males, two were black females, and two were white females. Five suspects were in the age group of 18 to 24. Three suspects were in the 25 to 34 age group. Three were 35 to 44, and one was 45 and older. During the month of August, we submitted a total of 295 cases to county prosecutors. 236 of those cases were to Jackson County, 39 to Clay County, 20 to Platte County, and one to Cass County. I also want to thank and take the time to thank our detectives in the economic crime and property crimes. A few weeks ago, a gas station clerk a gas station clerk noticed something unusual with a gentleman. She noticed that on one hand, the gentleman had a significant amount of cash and then he was depositing money into an ATM Bitcoin. She immediately called our detectives and Sergeant Henriot from property crimes or economic crimes and Sergeant Jeffrey O'Rear responded to the crime scene or to the scene. They made contact with the gentleman Initially, he didn't want to give out any information, but they persuaded the victim and they discovered that he was being scammed right there on the spot because they had the scammer or the victim had the scammer telling the victim, you need to deposit that money or someone is, is going to try to take that money from you. Someone's going to scam you. Not only that, but you also had to do the same thing with the other two bank accounts. So... The detectives did an amazing job convincing the gentleman to stop doing that, and they saved him about $11,000 just on that, plus the two bank accounts that later on he was going to do the same thing. And they did this. They responded to the crime scene or to the scene immediately, and not only they did that, but they also reached out to the family members of, of the victim and assisted him with managing his finances and it was incredible to see how these detectives took that time immediately to respond to the to the scene and and help this gentleman i remember reading about that earlier yes. and my question was could they catch the scammer that's that's a difficult part oh. because most of them are going to be in different countries and that's unfortunate but it's it's hard to catch this going. Well, at least you saved him that money and protected his other bank accounts. At Thank least 11000 plus the other two bank accounts. And we're still working that case. Good. Thank you. Unless you have any other questions, we have Detective Kirsten Jorgensen from the Drug Enforcement Unit. She's going to present us a brief presentation about fentanyl and overdoses. Hello, I'm Detective Kirsten Jorgensen, and this is my boss, uh, Sergeant Mike McKenna. And we're mainly going over the dangers of fentanyl and synthetic cocaine. Ma'am, you're gonna, ma'am, you're gonna want to make sure you use the mic. Thank you. Synthetic um, opioids today is what we're going to be discussing, and fentanyl. So, a quick picture of it to see just how little fentanyl it takes to kill you. Um, a lot of times, if it's not just one pill, it's just a little portion of a pill um, that can kill most people. 
We originally started logging and mapping overdoses in January 1st of 2022. And the current date, we've had 598 total reported overdoses. As you can see, 190 were fatal and 408 were non-fatal. And these are the ones that have been reported. Breaking it down from year to date, in 2022, we had 308 total, and that included fatal and non-fatal. Um, year to date for 23 has been 290. Again, that is fatal and non-fatal. Again, these are reported. So these are the best numbers that we have working with. Using our OD map, you can see this is where the reported ones we ha are required to input every information that we have, all of the overdoses that we receive. Um, the pink dots are the fatal overdoses, and it's broken down between if Narcan was used, dosages of Narcan, or if it's unknown. So currently, when Kansas City is notified of an overdose, uh, we have several steps in, take, in part that we take. First and foremost, patrol arrives. Uh, they assess the scene and then usually contact EMS, uh, regardless if it's if a bystander has given Narcan or not, we contact EMS, EMS comes in, if need be, they will respond with Narcan. Then a casualty report is taken for a non-fatal overdose. Um, and if it is a fatal, fatal overdose, our homicide unit is investigating those. Non-fatal overdoses, our drug enforcement unit is uh, investigating those. And with that, we are contacting all of the overdose victims, uh, asking that they help us so that way we can find out where their narcotics came from, um, how often they use, how long they've been using, get them services to help. If they're unwilling to speak with us, a lot of times we end up speaking with family members or the reporting parties to let them know, here's some services that you can use because addiction is something that all walks of life and it's not just the individual addict that's struggling with that. Usually it's family members, close friends, children. Um, and then OD, like I said, we have to track all of those. Um, it's nationwide, but we specifically do our Kansas City ones. And then if possible, we will work a criminal case on if we can find out who the dealer was. So a lot of times those come into uh, conspiracy, drug conspiracy cases that will work. Excuse and me. Do our officers carry Narcan? At this time, we're, we're going through the procurement process in order to get that for all the officers, but at this time, no. So, and then we also provide training, uh, education, and prevention, and that's a combination of training for we as detectives, <clears throat> our officers, and then also spend a lot of time in communities, probably anywhere from one to three a month. Um, I know I have one scheduled with um, TMC this week and the veterans, and we also often uh, school districts will contact us and we'll give a watered down version of some of the information to different age groups and also our Citizens Academy. So depending upon the age group and the group that we're working with, we kind of dial in on what education we give. Oops, did I miss one? Oh. So back to 2016 is when we started seeing um, from our cram lab narcotics that were laced with fentanyl. And so we've been working on this for a while. The biggest issue that we've come in contact with is the counterfeit pills. Uh, people aren't sure what they're getting, they're made, um, and the way that they're made or how much fentanyl is within each pill. So you might get a half a pill with very little, or you get the half a pill with a lot. Um, one of our sergeants down the analogy that I've heard is the chocolate chip cookie analogy. Somebody might get a cookie, a plethora of chocolate chips and somebody might get the short end with not that many. So that's once you get a pill, same kind of concept applies for that. Um, 
since fentanyl is so addictive, as a person is addicted to opioids, they require that need for the first time high. So they're always having to get more and more and more as their body builds up a tolerance. So that requires the purchase of more pills, which then falls into the whole other category of all the other criminal activity that brings in to get that money to buy that narcotic. Um, and then synthetic opioids, of course, are stronger and cheaper to make. Um, to date, there are at least 30 plus, if not more, different analogs of fentanyl. So um, every time that something is acknowledged by the DEA, then we as law enforcement are several steps behind because the chemists can change just one little aspect of it and have a whole new analog. And um, so then getting those classified as controlled substances is always a chase that we're doing. Um, and then also, currently, it is more common for we as detectives when we're testing narcotics and or the lab is to find a narcotics such as methamphetamine, uh, heroin, cocaine, that is fentanyl added to it than just straight methamphetamine. So the, we've almost reversed what we were seeing. The biggest problem when we're dealing with especially uh, youngers, uh, teenagers and whatnot is if the, if the pill is true, actual prescribed, or is it a counterfeit? So fentanyl overdose, opioid-based overdose is the number one killer for people between the ages of 18 and 45, 45. So a lot of times what you're finding, especially with uh, younger late teens, early 20s, is they might think that they have gotten a Xanax from a friend, family member, or whatever, and actually it looks close enough to the true pill, but it's actually a counterfeit pill with fentanyl. So they might think that they're just taking a Percocet, a Xanax, and anticipating that high, but instead they're getting a fentanyl. So fentanyl seized by Kansas City, this is one seizure that they had. And this just kind of shows the sales and why it is that it's so, um, the money behind it, a street sale for a kilo is anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand dollars, which but resale on the street is a hundred thousand. And these little pills that are about the size of an eraser head, and uh, most common is the M30, is uh, depending upon where you're buying and from whom you're buying and how many you're buying is ten to twenty dollars a pill, which then brings it back that once you're dealing with teenagers relatively affordable for them to buy a few pills. So just some of the science behind fentanyl and opioids, what it does is it triggers in your brain and it actually resets your brain, um, causing it to be so highly addictive. Um, from speaking with addicts, especially opioid-based addicts, that first high, they will forever be chasing that and they will never obtain that. So it requires more and more each time to even just get to where they need, which then also turns into the withdrawal symptoms. Um, if you've ever had the very worst case of the flu or God forbid those that had corona, multiply that hundreds, thousands, and that's what some of these opioid-based addicts um, explain as what their withdrawals are, and they are what they refer to as dope sick. So they actually need that and or need to go through a clinical withdrawal with, under medical um, observation so that way they don't die from their withdrawals. And then um, by adding the fentanyl to the other narcotics, it then creates a demand, a consumer demand for the narcotic because once you're addicted to methamphetamine and what you're able to do on methamphetamine and whatnot, well, it's cheaper and whatnot for a fentanyl addiction than it is for a heroin addiction for dealers. So if we can, we, excuse me, if the drug dealers can get you addicted to an opioid 
it's cheaper for them. And then they're going to have you coming back on a more regular basis and they're going to make more money off of it. Some of the officer safety issues that we're dealing with is uh, officers that are having secondary contact. There's been several times on the news where they've had to show that they've had to give a Narcan to our to other officers because they were rendering first aid or were on a call and unaware of the amount of fentanyl that was at that call, requiring <coughs> them to then have Narcan or other life-saving issues because they were had a secondary overdose. Um, and then also the biohazards of it. There's the open source from needles. Um, and then if you have any of the STDs, STIs from bloodborne pathogens. And then also on the mental emotional safety side for our officers, um, having to deal with investigating child overdoses pulls at your heartstrings. And then also dealing with parents who are incapable of properly caring for their children because they themselves have addicts. And then last, what we're seeing is the new trend. What? Is the new trend on xylazine, and that's coming in. We follow trends in the Northeast, and xylazine is the new drug that's coming in. However, it is nar not, uh, Narcan will not counteract it. So on the on the page where you're talking about when they come in contact with uh, a fentanyl user, is there like a hazard warned to help protect the officer? It's regular precautions, rubber gloves, um, if you have to provide CPR, a mask, and then the best uh, practice is not to use hand sanitizer, but to just use straight soap and water, wash your hands. One of the things it says is they get hit with an untapped needle that all you can do is try to avoid that. But. I think it would be, if I may, Madam Chair, very worthwhile for all of our officers um, or our patrol cars at least to have Narcan. I will note in terms of a funding opportunity, the city of Kansas City is part of a settlement of a number of states and cities relating to the uh, opioid industry. I forget how much we received, and I'll be wrong if I got it, although I know I'm starting to see ordinances that are spending the money. What that suggests to me is, um, in fact, I think the health department will spend probably about $2.5 million of it this week. Um, it probably is about a $12 million settlement, which suggests to me that there is sufficient funding to help support if you wanted to work a little faster on how you might get it. So it might require a sole source or something of that sort, but I would strongly encourage you to do that. I may interject for one quick second. Um, yeah. Earlier this year, through a uh, grant source, we were able to obtain Narcan, so we have been fielding it in our patrol vehicles for the last couple months. Oh. Well, okay. but if we can get more and right. the settlement can pay for it, I would like for you to examine that. All's okay. good. Great. Just we'll, we'll just get that covered. Chief and knows my mind. Your that. comment was that you don't have it for your detectives. Is that... Currently, all the detectives and everybody in the Special Investigations Division has it. Okay. Okay. We have firsthand contact with a lot of people that have it, so. Okay. Well, if we can get more and somebody else pays, that's great. Right. Thank you. One well, other question I have for you, ma'am. Um, the thing that I've never gotten about this and um, never been in the business, from my understanding, most people who sell vices like their um, clients to survive largely, rather gambling or drinking or, or other drug areas. The high level of fatalities and, and other things that occur, is the seller um, or provider of these sorts of things, and perhaps there are thefts sometimes as people obtain them, is it just that the money is so good that um, you are kind of selling whatever or are you hiding the fentanyl and something else? I, I just... I just don't get the the play from how I've understood drug dealers. I don't really understand them, but to exist over the years. Yes, because they, by adding the fentanyl um, to somebody who is not or not wanting to be an opioid addict, 
adding the fentanyl, you're now creating an opioid addict, which then creates a consumer market for the narcotics dealer. Thank you. Been wondering. I just had a question too. Isn't there like special foundations out there that, and I know I've seen the library get provided with Narcan and I, I did a ride along and got to experience. So we got called out on somebody had OD'd. And when we got there, he had Narcan in his leg already. And we thought he was dead. And a couple minutes later, he just popped up like nothing was wrong and took his pizza and didn't want to see, you know, EMTs and left. Um, isn't there nonprofits that provide that to the users as well? Yes. And it's not uncommon uh, for officers when searching vehicles, property, for opioid-based addicts to regularly carry Narcan with them. We're partnered with uh, First Call and Combat's new Strive, Strive Network for resources. So the detectives are interviewing somebody and they recognize that they have an addiction problem. We refer them for services. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Colonel Ortiz, is that all? Thank you. Colonel Maben. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. My information is under tab C in your books, but you can also follow along on your screen. I'll begin with some updates and some notable events from the Patrol Bureau. We've previously discussed street racers and sideshows in these meetings. Um, these incidents place drivers, spectators, and the general public at risk. There also have been disturbances and assaults associated with these events. I know Commissioner Tolbert has been actively involved in trying to come up with solutions along with community members and elected officials. Our traffic division has conducted multiple enforcement operations over the past several months to curb this behavior. I briefly want to highlight one such operation that occurred about two weeks ago near 9th and Wyoming. We partnered with KCKPD, who was experiencing the same problems just across the state line near James Street and Central. So basically, we flooded both sides of the state line with officers and attempted to stop participants and spectators. When they refused to stop, both agencies deployed tire deflation devices and then wrote tickets to, uh, we wrote tickets to individuals on Missouri state line side, and then KCK wrote tickets to people on their side of the state line. In total, officers issued 20 traffic citations, deployed stop sticks on 17 to 18 vehicles, towed three vehicles, and recovered one firearm. Another ongoing issue is stolen autos. This year, we've had a 31% increase in stolen autos compared to last year, and an 80% increase compared to 2021 year to date. This is in due in large part to thefts of Kias and Hyundais. Now, it's been widely reported that certain Kias and Hyundai models between 2011 and 2021 have security vulnerabilities that make them easier to steal than other vehicles. So Kia and Hyundai have been offering anti-theft upgrades for certain targeted vehicles, and we recommend people contact their dealerships to see if their vehicles are available. However, in the interim, the Community Engagement Division has been giving out free steering wheel locks to Hyundai and Kia owners. Uh, the locks were provided by the companies, and we still have a few left. So if you have a Kia or a Hyundai and need one of these locks, please contact Major Kari Thompson. Uh, her information is on the screen, but uh, Kari, K R I dot Thompson at kcpd.org, or you can stop by the Community Engagement Division office at 635 Woodland, Suite 2105B. Also, want to highlight Shoal Creek Patrol Division's efforts with regard to houseless outreach. Over the past few weeks, Shoal Creek officers and the division's social service providers have contacted approximately two dozen houseless individuals, both in camps and panhandling at intersections. They've offered services in an attempt to get help for these individuals and get stable housing. 
They're able to get four people into voluntary services and off the streets. And they were also able to reunite one gentleman with his family from out of town. And the family has agreed to take him in and help him get back on his feet. On July 26, the Community Engagement Division conducted a community walk in Metro Patrol Division as a response to a sharp increase in gun violence in the area of 79th to 85th homes to prospect since the beginning of the year. CED, Jackson County Combat, and community partners walked through neighborhoods and had conversations with area residents. They also provided informational material about community resources for trauma counseling, healthcare, substance abuse treatment, youth services, employment opportunities, and a host of other things. During the walk, several members of CED who are certified in crime prevention through environmental design identified several environmental factors that could be addressed to help re reduce crime in the area. For example, the city was contacted in regard to <coughs> several seat street light replacements, tree trimming, and a vacant house with uh, multiple code violations. During the month of August, community partners, Metro Patrol Division, and CED continued to concentrate on the area. From January 1 through the end of July, there were eight homicides and 10 non-fatal shootings in the area. But since the community walk and some of the follow-up, there have been zero homicides and zero non-fatal shootings uh, in the same area. I want to comment on that really quick, and I think it's just from a, a question or a comment you said earlier about when you're looking at, at, at funding over uh, at city council. That right there is is what I was talking about. But in those situations, you have to have police. Um, I just read a, a an article when we were talking about our focus deterrence model, and and there are these street outreach groups that come out and and they look at the the difference between. The, the impact they make on crime. And then when you have a, a police involved approach, which is focused deterrence, there you have evidence-based reduction in violent crime in those programs that involve law enforcement. We are, we are part of the solution. So I, I can't stress enough how important we are, like us all coming together for this multi, multidisciplinary uh, task force and this approach, the citywide approach of violent crime, that works, but um, we are an integral part of that. So I just wanted to, to note that. Thank you. Deputy Chief Maven. I also want to discuss Faith in Blue Week. Faith in Blue started in 2020 by Movement Forward, Inc., working with the COPS office at the United States Department of Justice. Their goal is to facilitate safer and stronger communities by engaging law enforcement officers and local residents through connections of faith-based organizations. So law enforcement agencies will partner with faith-based institutions and host community events during Faith in Blue Week. We participated each year since its inception. This year, it will take place on October 6th through October 9th. And this year's events will include, include a prayer breakfast at Colonial, Colonial Presbyterian Church, safety fair at Northland Neighborhoods, Inc., a block party in the Blue Hills neighborhood, a tailgate party at Morningstar Baptist Church, pretty clergy event at Must Macedonia Baptist Church. To response times. The median response time for priority one calls during the month of August was approximately eight minutes and two seconds. That's a high. The median response time for priority two calls was 10 minutes and 19 seconds. That's a two second decrease from the previous month. You also have the August 2023 traffic summary report in your book. I'd like to direct your attention to the number of traffic fatalities this year. After several months of being on pace to have fewer traffic related deaths compared to 2022, at the end of August, we had 60, which was equal to the last year during the same time period. In fact, the traffic unit uh, responded to seven fatal crashes during the month of August alone. In response, and I, I briefly mentioned this last time, the traffic enforcement unit has initiated a weekly targeted enforcement plan with the goal of reducing fatal accidents. 
The target zone will change each Tuesday and is selected based on high crash locations. The idea is for traffic officers to saturate the area in the week to hopefully slow drivers down and thereby reduce the number of traffic fatalities. And they'll keep track of their activity and then they'll evaluate the effectiveness and then move to a different area. When they do that work, do they also try to see if there's something about the pavement or the way thing to talk to like the highway department or something to see if it's the entrance onto the highway or whatever it is. I'd like our officers to say, here's what, in addition to speed, and I understand speed kills, but there could be some design things at some of those intersections that would make a difference. Absolutely. Thank you. Last month, Commissioner Tolbert requested information on the crisis intervention team. So I asked Sergeant Ashley McCunniff to provide a brief presentation on the unit. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate your time to present on this and I appreciate Commissioner Tolbert um, mentioning that crisis intervention is important. So thank you for that, sir. Thank you to the command staff for this. I am Sergeant Ashley McCunniff, like Colonel, Colonel Maven said. I am over the crisis intervention team. This is my wonderful staff of four people for the entire city. Um, we are busy. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of what we do. There we go. So CIT, which is what we call crisis intervention team, started back in, after a 1987 shooting of an individual that suffered from mental illness. Um, unfortunately, it was a police involved shooting. The individual died. Um, the public demanded something different from the police department, and that's when crisis intervention team training was created. So what that is, what CIT is, it's not just training, it's community partnerships. So we work with mental health professionals, hospitals, courts, everything you can think of to help individuals with behavioral health crisis. So I need the smart people. Sorry. So 1987 was when that shooting happened. 1988 is when CIT was created. Lee Summit Police Department was the first one in the area that traveled to Memphis to see what the CIT training was. After that, Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, Jackson County Sheriffs and Independence all got together and began collaborations to bring CIT to the Kansas City metro area. And that's when our Mid-America CIT Council was formed. So we don't just have CIT as a standalone, it's a council. So within our council, we have 24 law enforcement agencies from Jackson, Cass, Platt, and Clay, and then 17 community mental health centers. So that's University Health, Tri-County Mental Health. Uh, we also have 11 participating community partners, which the courts, um, advocacy groups, grant development and research and evaluation organizations, which would be MARC, RDI, which I can provide you with a very lengthy, I think it's 97 page um, research document on CIT for 2022, if you're interested in that. So the overall CIT training, so we, we have CIT, we have a dedicated unit, but what does that mean? So CIT training is a 40 hour training. In 2018, Chief Smith mandated 16 hours of mental health training to our recruits in the academy. This year, thank you to Chief Graves, she mandated the full 40 hours be taught in the academy to our recruits. We just completed that training last week. We have um, total for KCPD, we have 531 trained officers, uh, 54 professional staff are trained. So we allow other people to go through that are not just sworn police officers. Some of our social services staff went through last week since we work hand in hand with them as well. Um, and then in 2022, we had 185 officers that completed our 40 hour training. So we have the basic CIT, which explains what mental health is, what behaviors look like, substances, all of that. But we also offer advanced training, which focuses on the youth. Um, Cause we all know that youth are in crisis more than ever now. Um, we have veteran CIT, which is specific to veterans and what they deal with, um, and then telecommunications because, you know, our dispatchers, our call takers, they go through a lot on their end with 
the mental health, and so we're training them also. One of the amazing things that the state of Missouri has is the CBHL program. In 2013, Governor Nixon created this program, and it was part of the Strengthening Mental Health Initiative. We're the only state in the country that has this program, and so what this is is that the community mental health centers around the state have the CBHLs is what they're called, um, but they are mental health professionals that work directly with the police. They're, they work with us, they work with the courts, they work in the jails. Um, I think as was mentioned earlier um, by Chief Graves, you know, a lot of people, like we can't make people get help for their mental health. Sometimes like we are all about alternatives to incarceration, but sometimes they have to go to jail because we can't force them to get treatment. And so we do have these CBHLs that are working on the back end trying to get them help while they're in jail. So um, initially we only had 31 across the state when this was created. Um, that has been increased and now we have 81. They also created what we call YIBLs, um, which are the Youth Behavioral Health Liaisons, and there's 32 of them across the state. So here is what my team does. Those CBHLs and those YBHLs I just mentioned, my team goes out with those um, fabulous people that we work with, and we do follow-up residence checks and try to get people engaged in services. So our city is um, divided into catchment areas for the community mental health centers, and so whichever area it is, they'll take that mental health professional out with one of my officers to try to get those people engaged in services. So they're following up on all the CIT reports that are written by uh, members of the police department. Um, we're available to assist patrol on calls for service. We always have, some, one of my team members is always on call and I'm always on call. Um, if we can assist over the phone or if we can need to respond out, we're available. Um, we attend community events and meetings. We've also been doing a lot of presentations for the community to businesses to educate them on, you know, when to call the police, how to handle situations. Um, so we're always available for those. And then we assist with the local CIT training. Um, our council has an education committee, and so we're very involved in, um, actually, Officer Kenobi, who's on my team, is the co-chair for that council. And so he designs the training for the year of what that's going to look like. These are just some stats from my team. Number of people contacted from the beginning of the year, so August 31st was 1,328. When we make contact, oh, you can, as you can tell, over half of those people will engage in services, um, which decreases the calls for service that the patrol is getting. Um, again, we can't force them. I mean, some people will decline services, um, and unfortunately, we can't do much with that, but we still try. Um, if more reports come in, we'll still continue to try to outreach people to engage them in services. This just gives you a breakdown of the reports by division. As you can see, Center Patrol has the most um, CIT reports in the city. Well, no, sorry, Metro. Um, Metro's beating them just a little bit. Um, Center Zone usually has a high number just because of the houseless community is very high in Center Zone. Some of the current projects we're working on, um, I know calls for service is a big thing and the wait times. Um, just last week, Captain Jennifer Jones submitted a um, MOU so that we can start, our call center can start transferring calls to um, 988 to get the community the appropriate resources and not tie up officers on calls they don't need to be on. So that's a big thing we're working on right now. Um, I do have a houseless outreach team in addition to you know, the CIOs and the community and engagement division. Um, they go out a few times a month with community partners such as Veteran Community Project, Restart, University Health, um, I know I'm missing a few. Um, and then, um, so they just try to outreach people, see if they can get them in services, what we can do for them, you know, asking them what it would take to get them housed, those kinds of things. And then um, another project, we're having conversations with KCFD on a more efficient crisis response. A lot of times the police are getting calls for people in crisis and we're not the appropriate response to that. So we're just trying to talk to other community partners of what does that look like? What can we do different? Um, to take the, the taxing of the mental health calls from the police department and give the community what they need. And then we are also working on a CIT statewide reporting system. 
This is something that St. Louis County PD has um, been champion. And what this would do is all the agencies across the state would have one system through mules um, that they would write the CIT reports on because a lot of our individuals we deal with are transient. So we would have access to information if somebody had been in St. Louis or Columbia or you know, Cape Girardeau or wherever it is, we'd be able to access it. Whereas now sometimes people show up in our city and we don't know where they came from. And President, if I may have a Go right question. Ahead. Uh, thank you for that. That is very compelling. Um, and there's a lot of focus on individuals with mental health. I'm curious in those efforts. Um, oftentimes, it's the families around those individuals that need the tools um, to try and manage that situation. Is that any part of uh, what we're trying to accomplish? And, and that is addressing the families and supporting their needs with, with dealing with family members. Absolutely. So a lot of times, not a lot of times, but we get the report for the person that was in crisis, but we understand that you can only do so much for that person in crisis if they don't have the support around them. And when the officers are called to these scenes, we're dealing with something just happened, but that was a long rooted, you know, thing that's been going in that family. So we do supply resources for the family and anybody else that can help get that person, you know, stable and, um, the support they need because a lot of times people are in crisis because they haven't had support and people don't know what they don't know. And so we try to do the education and the resources for everybody involved if they're willing to take it. Yes, sir. So chief, I think that I, I love this report. I think that something we need to work on is since this has been around since 2013, moving forward, we should have a mental health intervention team when people call in and we know it's mental health from the beginning because i still say we just we we send gunslingers to a mental health crisis and that's not a good combination um that's why well when you have police, you, I mean, obviously we enter every situation armed, but uh, that's why we make sure that, and I've mandated that all of our members coming out of the academy and have received that CIT training, that crisis intervention training. Um, also this year we've, we've done ICAT training that has, um, it's, it's another de-escalation tactic that we've implemented here at KCPD just to try to be, um, to ensure some of those situations are resolved as peacefully as possible. Thank you for the report. It's a great report. I'll just add to what the chief just said. And that is also some of the purpose behind being able to transfer to 988 because a lot of times people don't need a police response. They need a mental health professional. So by getting them to 988, they can actually speak to the mental health professional. Um, and 988 also has mobile response teams. So they can send out mental health professionals to that person's residence if needed. If there's an issue of violence or safety or something like that, then they'll call back and dispatch us. Um, but that is one of the things that's being worked on because you're right. I mean, when people are in crisis, they don't necessarily want somebody with guns. They want someone that's going to help them. So we try to do both and work with community partners so we can give them the right response, but we're still there for safety. I'll just be um, positive and say thank you um, for this work. When I talk to other mayors, um, health professionals in this community, I visited with University Health the other day persons in crisis really are in many ways one of the greatest challenges to the American city today. Um, and the work that you are doing is at the center of it all and delivering not just public safety solutions as you're all trained to do, but I think expanding to areas where frankly, um, we have not staffed up on our mental health professional side to the level we would like in society. And there are many reasons for that, but you all, connecting people with the services they need, responding to those in crisis uh, is a is vital, uh, a vital resource for the people of Kansas City. So thank you all who work in that space. And thank you, Chief, for ensuring that our officers, all of them coming through Academy, will have more of that training. And, and we'll have follow-up training over time, right? <clears throat> in service, okay. Uh, Colonel Niemeyer. So, uh, did, wait. Was Deputy Chief uh, finished? 
Yep. Chief I, Maben. I, I, that concludes my report unless you have any questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have given you the opportunity. Very good. My items are under tab D. Of course, we have a presentation if you'd like to follow along. Always with the department strength to begin with. As of uh, the end of last month, our numbers didn't change 1,099. Law enforcement, we have 43 police officer candidates, 501 professional staff, which is up eight from last month. Our law enforcement hiring, um, we currently have 19 in the eligibility process. We have 14 that we've given job offers to the, the class will begin on October the 30th. And we currently have one person uh, that is lateraling that's in the process as well. Communications, uh, we've hired 17 since the beginning of the year. We have one pending job offer now, and we have 12 in the process. Uh, and we are continually working on that as we talked about last month, we have taken over hiring of of communications and I think Deputy Chief McComb will expand on that in his presentation. Let me ask about that. I, I don't exactly understand why you have some of it and Colonel McComb has some of it, but in a d disappointing fashion about 911 responses. And I want some one of you, whoever would be the appropriate one, to read it and then contact this woman and tell her what we do. She's making suggestions of things that we can do. I think it's stuff we're already doing, but I want her to know that we're listening. And um, I don't know if any of you got to see it. I just saw it this morning. Bethany um, gave it to me this morning. But um, one of you guys, I'd like to, for you to look at it, and then one of you respond and let me know how it went. Yes, ma'am. We'll, I'll handle it. I haven't Thank seen you. it yet, but I'll handle it. Thank you. Sorry so to interrupt. I guess to answer the question on who is, we are taking care of hiring. Okay. We, we from the beginning, the time you put your application in to the time that you are hired and then you're placed, just like I also happen to be in charge of hiring in the academy. So we are now in charge of the hiring of the folks, call takers, and then once you are hired, you go to the communications unit, and then that's when, from there forwards, that's Deputy Chief McCollum. Okay, if so that answers the question. That that's very helpful. And if they're not performing properly, it's Colonel McCollum's problem. <laughs> <laughs> Say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Is hiring. Okay. Thank you. Next slide is uh, our law enforcement testing dates. This is for future classes, and I'll announce one of those in a minute. But we will have. Our testing dates is October the 21st, November the 16th, and December the 13th, all of which takes place at our Regional Police Academy at 6885 Northeast Pleasant Valley Road. Um, that is also on our website. So anybody who is interested in a testing date, we will continue to put these up. I put this slide up every month so that everyone is it's just aware. Um, hiring in all aspects of, of the department again, one of my favorite pictures there on the left of James, everybody knows he's out front every day when you come in the building. Uh, we want to make sure that, that people know he's, he's, he's brought it to our attention on more than one occasion. We write more building security folks as well. Uh, not, we always talk about DFOs. We talk about call takers, building security, um, mechanics, many professional staff jobs here that, that, and I'm sure I missed somebody. So I'll get a phone call for next month and we'll add the next person that, <laughs> We want to know that everybody understands that we need professional staff uh, as well as law enforcement. So please apply. There is a multitude of opportunity. Recruiting events that we uh, we went to this past month. We had the uh, MCC Career Fair. We're always at T-Mobile uh, under the bridge, Baker University. But I was asked and I asked my staff to make sure that we started hitting all the high schools and as many high schools as possible and that 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 the high schools were starting back. So. We were at Raytown, Raytown South, Park Hill, Grandview, Lincoln, Hogan, Park Hill again, Smithville Career Day, and Ray Peck just this month. Um, I am. We have more on the schedule. It's a lot of times we have to get with the uh, counseling staff at that school and find the appropriate time. So we have reached out to many of these school districts and look to have more of those in the future. We swore in two lateral transfers on September the 20th. 
So that added to uh, the numbers. And this is uh, something that's kind of near to me. Um, and I, I didn't even know they were doing this or I probably would have participated. Uh, this is the 178th intern officer class. And this is a run that they did uh, in memory of uh, Blaze Madrid Evans, who was killed with the Independence Police Department. His former partner when he was an EMT is now in that class. And they uh, requested to do that. And that is a picture of them on the day that they did that. Hundred seventy eighth infantry officer class is due to graduate on November the second. If anybody would like to, uh, any one of the board members, or I always encourage uh, the executive staff to come. We will be having situational training coming up, which is uh, four nights of eight hours worth of calls all night long. Uh, it's basically their final exam. Uh, will be coming up soon. We currently have. Kansas City currently has 24 officers in that class, and we have 18 outside agencies, so it's a very large class of 42. The 179th class, has, and as I stated before, the 180th class will be starting on October the 30th. The employment unit, they're working hard. I, I challenge them each and every time. I'm ho uh, they, they go up and down on me, but we're really hoping to get the 20 number again. Uh, and always remember it's that short window to, to process that many people. And I'm, I'm really excited to announce that our 181st class will start on March the 18th. And the reason that's important is to announce that is because many folks have the opportunity to graduate over in December. Um, we also have people who may participate have participated in the summer internship program, things of that nature, but they look forward to when's the next class, the next class. I can't start October the 30th. When can I start? So these are, these are dates for the next two classes coming up. And then as soon as October 30th class starts, I'll begin talking about the one after March the 18th. And with that, that concludes my presentation, unless you have any questions. Excellent report. Thank you very much. That would be March 18 of 24, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry. Sure. Yeah, sorry. We, I, <laughs> That's I okay. Sergeant, Sergeant King had that on in the last second. So uh, we just we just solidified that date this week, I believe. So, yes, of 24. I apologize. I just want to thank um, Deputy Chief Niemeyer for all of his efforts as in relation to all of the challenges that we've face with with hiring and whatnot and um i think i just mentioned it once like hey we really need to get in the high schools and then as you could hear from his report we are everywhere <laughs> so i appreciate the work that you're doing um it makes a difference and it's reflective in uh, the quality of candidates that we have going through our academy right now and, and i will note recognizing that we've got a talented officer or two from kansas city kansas over the years who are residents of that community make sure we're getting to all of them um our officers from kck seem to do well at this department Thank you, Colonel. Colonel McCollum. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners and Mr. Mayor. All items for the Executive Services Bureau are located under tab <clears throat> E of your board book. <clears throat> Item A, budget transfers for fiscal year 2023-24. I request general fund and police grant fund, grant fund transfers. The general fund transfer moves 426,358 from personal services to contractual services. Due to appropriation cuts to contractual services, this transfer is necessary to ensure sufficient funding in categories for the normal operation of the department. The police grants fund transfer moves $55,970 from personal services in the amounts of 5,000 to contractual services, 18,000 to commodities, and 32,970 to capital outlay. The police grant fund transfers adjust appropriations to where they are needed now compared to when they were estimated in the fall of 2022 as the budget was being put together. Unless you have any questions, I recommend approval. Is there a motion? So move. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Few questions for you, just just so we know. Uh, yes, sir. And I hate when people do this to me. I'm probably going to vote in the negative anyway, but I feel like I should actually get the information. Am I reading it right to note that there's 175 transfer going to the chief's office and 
um, the 199 that goes to repair of operating equipment? Yes. Um, and just some description as to what both of those are. Yes, sir. The 175,000 is for legal fees and 199,000 um, will be to purchase uh, the shot spotter, um, which I will get to. I'll be coming to you for approval for that. So it's to purchase the shot spotter. That's going to patrol bureau. We're going to approve that later. Yes, I, I will get to that approval. I'm just wanting to move the money now so that we can approve it in a. I'd usually do it in another order, but I, I got you. Um, I won't hold us up. Just, Dan, yeah. You're good. I'm, I'm going to vote no anyway, So, <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. Thank you. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Nope. <clears throat> Next item. Item B, adjustment to special revenue accounts for fiscal year 2023-24. The department anticipates receiving $343,400 donation for body-worn camera batteries and ancillary equipment from the Police Foundation of Kansas City. Therefore, it is requested that $343,400 be appropriated from the unappropriated fund balance of the Special Services Fund to pay the cost of the body-worn camera batteries and ancillary equipment. Unless you have any questions, I recommend approval. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item C, request to purchase <coughs> body-worn camera batteries. While the implementing, with the implementation of the 11-hour work plan set to begin in mid-January, the department needs to purchase additional body cameras and chargers. The current batteries are performing well throughout the 10 hour shift. However, with heavy usage or extended hours, there are concerns the battery may not last. To mitigate this concern, we believe it is necessary to purchase additional batteries and chargers for each member to ensure they have a fresh backup. The total cost is 343,400 and the Police Foundation of Kansas City has agreed to reimburse the department as an extension of the original body worn camera project. Unless you have any questions, I recommend approval. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. A second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Are there is there any discussion? I just have a question here. So this is supplementary charging. Um, are these supplementary charging devices that would be with persons for that extra hour to get to eleven? Yes. What what we're going to do is issue each member who has a body camera, um, an extra battery and a charger, similar to how we do our police radios. They can take that home with them or keep it at the station, but they can charge the battery so that they have the extra battery on them so that if theirs does begin to um, lose a charge. And that's because of the one extra hour. So this wasn't necessary previously or, or was this something we would have liked to do before? Um, it's a combination. I mean, the one extra hour, but if they get overtime on top of that, um, and depends on how much usage it's going to get throughout the shift. So, I mean, we initially thought about this when we purchased these batteries the first time uh, for the 10 hour shift, because we were informed at that point that this was on the high end of the batteries life. Um, but we didn't, we didn't purchase the, the new ones at that time. Thank you. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Next one. Item D, Sound Thinking Incorporated Renewal. Sound Thinking Incorporated is the provider of the shot spotter technology. The annual renewal for this subscription is $199,358 and will run from October 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2024. This technology has been used by the department since 2012. Unless you have any questions, I recommend approval. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? second. <laughs> Motion's been made and seconded. All in, excuse me, any discussion? Question on this, didn't this initially, <clears throat> and perhaps I'm confusing them, there was a federal grant that helped support ShotSpotter at some point, and I believe funding came through actually the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority um, and ultimately went to the technology 
that we, the department that is, have the ability to utilize. Does that still occur or has the cost just transferred to KCPD? Um, it's transferred to us. I believe that has, that portion has run out and it's now our responsibility to do it. Okay. I mean, editorial point is just, that's the one concern with technologies. Sometimes they're all very good and we get the grants and then somebody has to pay for it long term after that. And while, and I think, and maybe those who were around with it before, it was kind of when we got Prospect Max, the bus rapid transit line down Prospect Avenue, there were federal funds that helped support this. Those run out. ATA's mission connection to it, I guess, is is perhaps in a different place now. But if I were being a real spendthrift, because I'm telling the chief where to save money in other places, I would really ask KCATA, who also receives a substantial amount from the city, about a $65 million check just to start their year, if they could actually continue funding this, which once existed in their budget for the next time, if possible. I will discuss that with them. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you. All right, the motion's been made and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Next. Item E, Addendum to Rosebrook's Subaward. <coughs> the department recently received an addendum to the original subaward from the Rosebrook Center. Rosebrook's was informed that a minimum of 50% of the total grant must be expended in order to avoid potential negative impacts on future applications for funding. Rosebrook's, Rosebrook's requests the amount of unused overtime provided to the department be reduced by $78,668.18 and an extension of the grant through December 31st, 2023. The total amount of the subaward is $135,147.82 and will continue to provide the department with funding for detective overtime, purchases of additional supplies and travel and training expenses. Unless you have any questions, I recommend approval for the reduction of the subaward and the three month extension. So moved, or sorry. It's fine. Got excited. Motion's been made. Is it sec is there a second? second. <laughs> Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor uh, say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Last one is no, it's not the last one. Last one on that <laughs> Unfortunately, page. Unfortunately, it's not. <laughs> on that page. <laughs> F. Several more. Operation uh, item Legend. F Operation Legend Grant Budget Modification. In 2020, the department was awarded federal grant funding federal funding through the Operation Legend Grant to support crime reduction efforts. As part of these efforts, the department requests the purchase of 52 <clears throat> laptops for crime lab personnel, violent crimes division personnel, and grant section personnel. In addition, the department requests 26 desktop computers for crime lab personnel. The total expenditure is $141,203.37, and the DOJ has approved this modification. Unless you have any questions, I do request your approval. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, and is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Next. Item G, bid number 2024-2, new 2024 model year Dodge Durango pursuit vehicles. On September 14, 2023, bid number 2024-2 was open for the purchase of 2024 Dodge Durango police vehicles, police pursuit vehicles. Landmark Dodge was the only dealer who responded. I recommend awarding Landmark Dodge the bid and the purchase of 39 new 2024 Dodge Durango police pursuit vehicles for an anticipated cost of one million seven hundred fourteen thousand four hundred and forty dollars. Unless you have any questions, recommend approval. Is there a delivery date for these, or is this going to be delayed due to the strikes? Well, yeah, that is a concern. Um, there may be. I I don't have that information. I can I can find that out. Um, I know that was some of the concerns with Ford, um, with the Ford Explorers. So, is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Just a few questions on it. Um, 
just to hear back again, you said we had one respondent? We did. We no. sent it to. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Please. Oh, we uh, we invited three companies to uh, to respond to the bid and place it on our department's internet, and we only had uh, Landmark Dodge respond. Um, and then, is this value in some way consistent with what we're usually paying for explorers? Is it more? Where where do we? Um, I think on? it's less exp I think it's about a thousand. It's less than the Ford Explorers. And one interesting thing about the Explorers, they're not even taking any new orders um, for them for the 2024 models and won't start taking orders until May for the 2025 models. So we need to get some of these older vehicles out and get our officers in some newer and safer vehicles. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item H, revised 2020 Project Safe Neighborhood Subaward. The Kansas City Metropolitan Crime Commission passed through the fiscal year 2020 Project Safe Neighborhood Subaward to KCPD. This revised subaward project increased to $162,643 and funds a crime gun intelligence center analyst, travel, training, and software. The Kansas City Metropolitan Crime Commission was approved for an extension of this award and passed that extension onto the department. The amended extension is from September 30th, 2023 to October 1st, 2024. If you do not have any questions, I request your approval to accept the subaward change. Is there so a motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. Motion carries. Item I, 2021 Project Safe Neighborhood Sub Award. The Kansas City Metropolitan Crime Commission passed through the fiscal year 2021 Project Safe Neighborhood Sub Award to KCPD. This sub award is for $160,000 and funds a crime gun intelligence center analyst and the partial funding for intelligence gathering software. This award period is from October 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2024. If you have any questions, I recommend approval. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 As opposed, no. Motion carries. Um, two more items. <laughs> um, update on communications. Currently, we have 35 dispatchers and 33 call takers. That's down 28 from where we need to be compared to 25 last month. We had five in uh, call taker training. However, we lost three. One left uh, during training. Um, Can you tell us the numbers again? I'm, I'm trying to track them. But sorry. Just so we have 35 dispatchers and 33 call takers. That's down 28 from where we need to be compared to 25 last month for both categories so the 35 plus 33 correct okay um so we lost three from um uh, communications unit two were in call taker training um one left the department the other um left but we were fortunately able to retain them as a dfo um, and then one active um, communications unit personnel left for a different department. So now we have two that are still in call taker uh, training and we have two that start next week. August wait time average was 42 seconds compared to 28 seconds in 2022 and 40 seconds last month. Communications unit received 94,302 calls per month compared to 86,833 in 2022, which is a 9% increase. 3,042 calls per day equates to 126 calls per hour. Colonel, if yes, I may ask a question, and I think I understand the division of, of responsibility in some ways here, Colonel Niemeyer is bringing us um, new call takers, new professionals. I would imagine it reports up to you as to satisfaction within the division and what gets people to 
stay or go. Correct. Right. Um, now, it seems as if through all those numbers, we lost several, which usually isn't that much of an aberration. However, of course, that would just be in the last month. Correct. Correct. And um, for the person who transferred to another department, do you understand the, or do you know the reason? Was that a salary or? Um, salary. They, they went to uh, Clay County and they're starting at 55,000. And, and right now we're not a le at a level to compete with that, but we're working on our pay structure for all professional staff across the, the board and certainly communications ranks high on that list. And have we, um, two questions. One, um, quality of life within the communications division. Have we evaluated how we can work to improve that even further? The second, of course, any special pay opportunities or other items to entice um, communications, perhaps as distinct from everyone else in connection with what's occurring now? We, we, we are. We're, we're trying different things. We're... Um, it's a it's a tough environment when they're just they can't decompress up there and we realize that and we're working with um jenny prohaska um to see what we can dr. do to, prohaska. dr prohaska yes um to get them resources that that they need to make that a a, a better environment it, it's it's difficult when you're stuck in a if i can around. interrupt really quick um Every month we meet, and I know that Commissioner Dean, I've talked to you about this. Every month we meet and we discuss working conditions in the communications unit and uh, better ways that, that we can make that environment healthier. And to ensure we, we've also um, received the, the pay structure uh, with the regional comparison from Mark. So we're looking at all of those things. You know, every time we have an employee that, that leaves communications, we ask the questions and we have the conversation of why specifically uh, that person left just to, to monitor and look at um, exactly what, what we can do as an organization to make that um, a better working environment to retain quality employees. So that's yeah. something that we look at. I will add that we had one that had left for a different department who has now reapplied and coming back. So we are drawing some back. Um, so I had a question too. Is this more, I mean, from what you're seeing, a citywide thing as well? Because I know Independence was offering like a 10,000 signing bonus. And we, we, had, call we had put that in our budget request last year, looking at um, offering a signing bonus, if you will, um, to bring people in. So. Well, and I appreciate that Dr. Prohaska is helping, and I, I want to make sure that she has the resources she needs um, because those folks, they may need, I, I don't know about counseling, coaching on how to deal with that kind of pressure that they're under. So I, I want to make sure that the people that are there, we're helping as much as we can. With this And this is not unique to KCPD. I, I read articles all the time, and this is all over the United States. I mean, dispatching is, is not an easy yes, environment to work in. That's not it's, an excuse. Oh, I'm not offering <laughs> <Okay>. one. I, <laughs> I understand. And I, I, I even sent an article to the chief not, not long ago about that very thing. Nationwide, it's a problem, but it's a problem that we have to address. And I might add this, and this is more a comment to my board colleagues rather than um, command staff, although you do bring us the recommendation. I mean, to the extent, for example, we talk about signing bonus and what was in the budget or not. We just did a transfer, for example, of $175,000 on legal fees. I would rather give $1,000, let's say, to everybody who's actually staying in the communications office, which would actually still be less than the legal fees cost. I mean, at a certain point, there are, and it could, the money could have stayed in personal services for what it's worth. I mean, there, there is a point where we have to think about solutions that aren't just we, that is, I just don't get to look at you, that aren't actually just the next budget year, or else I fear that we might find ourselves in this position, particularly in the event, which has happened in years past, that the entirety of the budget request isn't filled. And then do we, this is where I think assessments always are a question, where does it where does the cut come from and so 
I, I do think that it's important enough for the people of Kansas City to say, even now, if there are things that we're making transfers on, that perhaps there is some urgent need for us to consider what we could do. I agree with the sentiment expressed by the chair that, yes, it's a challenging time, but it's a challenging time in other jurisdictions, even nearby, um, with what we do. Understanding our volume is bigger, but we're also the biggest city. In brief, I will note, because the letter writer, I also found that letter compelling. I mean, she noted, this is the one we got from public comment today. She noted folks were on hold with 911, and then ultimately, I believe the successful caller who got through to someone just had said, hey, Google call, call St. Kansas City South Patrol. South Patrol. So I commend whomever at South Patrol answered the phone and, and helped us get our process moving. But in a fatality vehicular accident, by the way, not in a in a quiet kind of far off part of our city, but I believe on Warnell Road, um, you know, it, it's it's just increasing, it, you know, unacceptability. And I will note this. And plaintiff's lawyers are going to hit us anyway, so maybe they use my statements, maybe they don't. But either, look, we solve this from a humanity sense, because we need to, but also from a real liability sense. I, you know, it, it just seems that we know the concern, we, we're knowing the issues, and there should be that level of urgency. And I would, I would continue to recommend to this side of the shop, thank you on this side of the shop, to make sure that we're looking at everything possible to address it, and putting that pressure on Mid-America Regional Council to solve it too. Have we heard any more about the update so that we can have that those choices um, on the call? Auto in? attendant, yes. Um, Hassan with Mark is here for some detailed Mark-related um, questions. Okay. But where we are with reaching out to um, um, Jackson County, they don't have any funds. Um, no, for I I meant the company that's supposed to be doing the software so that we can do that. Yes. It, it's, I mean, they're working on it. It should be available after the first of the year, keeping on track with where they're at. Um, I can ask Hassan if he can come up. Yes, please. If he has any updates on that, but I mean, my communications with Motorola, they're on track for, um, you know, putting it together, the, the software that we need, but, the funding is the issue. Good morning. Or good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. About Did you hear our question about Motorola and the software that we need to be able to, when people call in, be able to send it to like 388, which she said this morning, and non-emergency and that sort of thing? I did. Uh, the last update from Motorola is the development still on track, but they're, you know, the... The due date isn't until first quarter of 24, so. I don't think we said first quarter. I think we said January. I may I misspoke then, first quarter. I should have said first quarter, which starts in January. And ends three months later. I mean, we are in trouble. What can you do to help us? Well, Motorola has uh, taken the request from, from Mark and the Public Safety Board to develop the solution. They're working on that. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else we can do at this point from a technology standpoint to assist with this issue. Okay. What can we do from not a technology point? Uh, well, Mark is not uh, involved in staffing matters at KCPD and more staff, more, more people there to answer the phone would would solve the problem, but that's not something that, that Mark can really assist with. Okay, can Mark talk to Motorola and say we'd like that faster? I mean, I thought waiting until January was way too long. So past January, it's not acceptable. Yeah, we can definitely talk to Motorola uh, and express KCPD's urgency. Mark doesn't consider it urgent? I, I didn't I didn't say that. <laughs> Can you express the urgency for Mark and KCPD? Definitely. Thank I, you. I, I've been having conversations with Motorola. I mean, they're they are aware of our urgency and they are working on it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's you know, they've never done this before. So they've they've got to take it's gotta go through all their development steps. It's I am amazed 
that our department is the only one in the nation that needs this. I, I, don't, I don't doubt what they've told you. I'm just telling you, I have trouble believing it. I think um, one thing that's unique about the environment here is that we're, we're a system of systems instead of being a, a singular system. So in a singular system, uh, the solution exists. If, if, if all the regional PSAPs are on one system, that solution's already there. But we're, not at, we're, we're a system of systems, so we're asking for that call to go from one system to another. And that's the hurdle. Uh, that, that, that is something that doesn't exist today. Thank you. Welcome. I may just add, um, you're fine. You're, you're good. I'll, I'll talk to them. They're used to me. But thank you for being with us. Are there any other questions from any other members? Of the board? Not yet. I'm still going to talk to them. I mean, it's, um, and you all get the point, and you, you understand why we want the urgency. For the people who see a fatality accident and are seeing a decedent in the street and can't get through to 911 and are calling South Patrol Division, you know, it, I guess I can go talk to them. And, and in fact, actually, this lady called me too. And I would, my response was not, all right, well, we'll wait till January and kind of see. And so I hope that you share with us our incredible concern, particularly to Motorola. Several of us worked very hard last year, yourself included. I know it was a different contract, but it was an $18 million contract from the taxpayers of Kansas City and City Council to try to make sure that we could work very quickly for them to get something done. And what the city slash everyone else is asking now is maybe do the same for us. So with the same urgency that we're having special city council meetings, finding appropriations of $18 million, which as you all know, is not easy to do. Please help us on this, particularly so this board doesn't have to decide to settle a series of cases that are worth $18 million because we've known about this problem. There are perhaps solutions and we're taking, you know, kind of a laggard approach, not saying that's yours, but hopefully that others share that. I will also say in connection with the system of systems, I mean, I, I, it's, we, have a, we have a separate lawsuit dealing with in some ways calls and where they go and all of that. We have this issue now. I start to wonder after a while, as somebody who's elected to represent the people of the city, it sure doesn't seem like it works for basic people right now in Kansas City. It, it just isn't. And so to the extent that there are other steps, which would be different for this board's evaluation, actually be this board and city council evaluating. I mean, we may push those two for how we actually address these. So to Commissioner Dean's point, perhaps we're not as unique in an awful way for our constituents. Two years after Bishop Tolbert started bringing us this issue, three years? I'm sitting here thinking about when it started. Yes. It's yes. been over No need for years. response. Over Thank you. Years. And yeah. so I would hope you share that with whomever listens, including people that the taxpayers of this city pay millions a year to to help us with these things. And, and he explained it to me. The reason we have this problem is because we have a system of systems. If we did it all on our own, it would be different. It would have been solved by now, apparently. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but I want to know if we would be better off if we were by ourselves. Well, the infrastructure is not there. Um, the, I can tell you it will be a, it will be a much different system. I can have a, a report for you next you know, month on what that would look like, but it's not as easy to, to run it ourselves. Um, as it sounds. Okay. Well, that was the message I got is that we'd be better off if we were alone. So figure that out and let me, yes, sir. Well, if I may. I, I wasn't suggesting that the city would be better off, excuse me, on their own. I was just uh, trying to elaborate on the complexities of, of, of what's at hand. Um, we are a system of systems, but with that becomes greater comes greater redundancy and protection and survivability. So if you were a single system all to yourself, you lose a lot of those protections. So I wasn't suggesting that KCBD should go and do their own thing and that you'd be better off that way. I was just saying that if it was a single system, that the solution to the auto attendant would be easier. But there are many other things that that factor into that as well. Thank you. I was going to say, I, I think I've had a conversation with a, with a, a couple of you on the board that um, Mark is a, a 
regional partner that offers us that interoperability with other agencies that if we were a standalone, we wouldn't have that, that availability to do that. I understand. So, I'll just say this to perhaps to the tenor of some other board comments. If you, you know, if my wife with my two year old today calls 911 and can't get an answer and, and we're blessed to have other people to call, but if, if our constituents are calling South Patrol or somebody else or calling somebody they know directly, then it really doesn't do us any real good, particularly because this is where the interface for the people of Kansas City is. So I understand the backup support and other things may be great, but if this MARC system is working for 2 million people in this area, but not the 508,000 in Kansas City, Missouri, who are actually calling 911 and who have ailing siblings or, or anything of that sort, then it seems to not be as efficient and effective as we'd like. And I will say this in terms of challenge. I would much rather the taxpayers of this city pay $20 million for an independent system we control than $20 million to my friends in the bar of Jackson County, who are actually just going to hit us on enough different wrongful death and negligence claims. Point taken. Thank you. Let, let me mention, I, I'm sitting here thinking about you know, we've been talking about this. This has been a very bureaucratic, yes. uh, slow moving system. And I haven't heard any innovative ideas of how we solve this. So I have a thought, you know, I know it's a, a lot of training, but we have a lot of college students in, in the community colleges at UMKC. What if we actually went after some of those students because they learn a lot faster than some of us who have, you know, <laughs> been around in the bureaucratic system for a while and came up with some part-time hours, a four-hour shift. Uh, you know, we, we keep thinking one system, but this is a crisis. There's a fire. Call the fire department. And, and, and I am just... I'm, I'm to my wits end that there is no innovation. So I, I, I think we got to do something different. Otherwise, we all get labeled insane. Well, I know who does the hiring. Colonel, can you work on that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we'll, we'll continue to do everything we can. Um, I will add that I mean, as a as a citizen of Kansas City and who has a wife and, and two children who are constantly driving, I I feel the sense of urgency and and the the mayor's concerns. I have those concerns as well. And and I want nothing more than to get this system to where it needs to be to support and serve the citizens of this city. So we will continue to work on it and do some outside of the box type thinking and sure. Because I'll make one last point, and I'm sorry, Madam Chair. One thing I've learned in my years of government is if there is enough money somewhere in this jurisdiction, Kansas City has enough of it to say, someone in the world, help us come up with a solution. Usually, and Mr. Whitaker works with government agencies all the time, usually someone will call us and say, we have one. And so not saying that we need to make new relationships, sever new relationships or anything of the sort, but I have a hunch to Bishop Tolbert's point that there is someone out there who at least can think about innovative solutions for us. And what I would encourage our partners to do, who are currently our incumbent partners, is to use the same energy and effort that they might do in procuring the business of St. Louis, perhaps, which I've read is having issues similar to ours, right? Um, with us now and today, given the urgency of all of it. And, you know, I. I won't necessarily have us just, although city council could just do an RFP and say 10 million bucks, fix our system for us and let us know. I don't want to get there yet, but if we stay at this position, I might. And so I'm just hoping that we convey that to those we work with. I appreciate your passion. I share it. And my conversations with Motorola will convey as such. Thank you. Is that the end? Or is there one? Oh more? man, I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the. Well, I have, I'm going to address the follow up. Do I? No. Oh. Um, follow up question to last month, I think yes. Commissioner Tolbert on Academy. Um, we reached out to several of the, the regional academies in the area, um, the four most used academies. Um, and what we learned is the tuition ranges from 444. $455 to $1,000 more, 
more than what KCPD is charging. Um, once we dug into that a little bit more, um, we discovered that a lot of those, because they're held by colleges or universities, um, those institutions are, are factoring in the cost for um, their students who are receiving college credit um, toward a degree in, in whatever. Um, so as with those, those are typically inflated college prices. Then you add in because now they're students of these uh, institutions they are paying the extra taxes that are often associated with um, a student going um, to a college or university. So I don't think we're, we're far off from that. We don't charge those to those going to our academy. Um, we don't, we don't have those expenses to pass on. Um, so the, so that's why we're able to provide a good academy training at a, at a lesser price than what some of the other agencies or, or colleges are charging. But his point was they might pay a higher price anyway because we have an excellent academy. Right, and that kind of goes to what I said earlier when I, I addressed that earlier about that, like what you brought up last month really sparked a lot of conversation and we're still having this, that conversation and that review here. Just one that we noted. But you didn't ignore us and I appreciate it. Thank mm. you. My pleasure. <laughs> no, but yeah. you did it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, well, I think that's it. Right. And welcome back, because I heard you cut your vacation early to be here. So we do appreciate that. Welcome. <laughs> Colonel. Hello. Yeah, so I have two related policies up for approval. Um, as part of our move to Lexapol, our current policy is the uniform and appearance policy, but Lexapol, they separate those two things. So uh, what we've done is we've pulled out the appearance part and updated that and it is in the lexical format for approval. But it's probably a little bit of a formality, the remaining uniform policy that we haven't touched yet in our old style. Uh, we are putting that up for approval as well, simply because we have removed so much from it. Uh, we think it looks substantially diff different just because we took out the appearance part. So we thought it was prudent to have that up for approval as well, even though there are no changes in the remaining part of the uniform if that makes sense. Um, and I appreciate the message that you sent to us to explain all that while we were looking at it. I found that helpful. Um, I'm going to ask for approval of both, and then we'll discuss it if there's questions. Is there a motion to approve both under tab F? So moved. There a second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? So I apologize. I was not able to review um, in full extent that conversation, but we never get to talk to you that much, so I appreciate it. Um, as a general sense, I think, and I'll go with the appearance standards before uniform regulations and have thoughts on uniform points. Um, I'm not a man who's blessed with long hair, and so um, this is all just from what I think others might convey or any number of things. I'll start with females. On females, hair can be longer than that bottom of the uniform shoulder. It would just need to be just tied. needs to be up, yes. It would be what? just needs to be up. It would need to be up right. in some way. All right. And so that seems to be um, something consistent with what we see in the United States military, for example, and other areas, yes. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think those <laughs> might be more rigid, but yes. But it's, I, I, but yes, it's not agree, laying agree. down. Yes. But yes, there's right. not hair down, there's hair up. And so that would make sense. Black hair accessor uh, hair accessories colored black. You don't want to start a new issue. Um, that's consistent with other departments and um, among other things, yes? I believe so. Okay. And then males, we've... Um, we have at uh, addressed a few areas that... Um, Mohawks are weird. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say things like that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Why, why no Mohawks, for example? I mean, so what, what's the thought there? Shouldn't it be more about length than just your style? or? So I would say, generally speaking, uh, under our current, hopefully previous uniform appearance policy, uh, we are hoping to return to much more of a professional appearance. Yes. 
We'll stop. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Um, and so men's hair now uh, will need to be, I guess we're going to collar rather than shoulder. Correct. Well, above the collar, yes. If I recall, I don't believe, can it touch the collar? I don't think it can, but yeah. So talk to me about the necessity for this a little more broadly. I, and I, I, maybe that's your full answer. And I like professional looking people and, and all of that. And it's um, how I live in the world too. I shave every day, all those things. But right. I know there are some who, who live differently. So why, why, particularly given the recruiting challenges that we may have now, is this something that's important? Particularly, let's say there's a short haired gentleman who would like to, Back when I had hair, I had rather short hair, and if I were to cut cut it in some sort of mohawk type style, why would that be obstructive to the job? It's a great question, um, and I think you could split it a bunch of different ways. But speaking for myself, right, I think that for every member that we might recruit of a man that wants to have long hair, uh, we may lose ten because we don't look like a professional organization. So you could debate that all day long, probably, and, and you could, you know, poll 200 people and, and get, you know, various different opinions on it. But uh, I think our desire, like I said earlier, is just to return to a more professional appearance. It's the party in the back part. Say that again. <laughs> it's the party in the back. <laughs> the long in the back. Right. That's good. All right. I understood on that. I believe the motion was to consider both at once. Yes. So. Then talk to me about the adjustments on our uniform regulations. If you could just give me a brief description. On the uniform part? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, so that part doesn't have any changes on the existing policy other than we have removed the appearance part and put it in the new lexical format. So, uh, But since it did remove about half of the policy, we felt it would be prudent to at least approve it because it looks substantially different, even though the remaining has no changes. Understood. And I hope I made that as confusing as possible. Understood. I will say this, and I, I respect professional appearances. And as I've done ride-alongs in other cities, I always respect departments that have that consistency, LAPD being one example and others. Uh, but I also will note in our hiring in a number of different departments at the city, um, the more flexibility we are able to have, the more we've been able to have folks. So um, I thank you for doing this work. I'm, I just have some concerns as to... Oh, we are in a right. new day, for sure. Uh, I agree. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. Um, the motion carries. That's all I have. Thank you very Thank much. You. The next on the agenda is Office of Community Complaints, and Mr. Bennigan had to leave, and he didn't have a report, so we're not going to take that. Are there any public comments? Wait, Kathy. I'm sorry. We've got the... Uh, Private officer licensing appeals. Oh, oh. I skipped that altogether. Six of them. Nathan, I'm sure you were disappointed. <laughs> Heartbroken, I'm sure. Yeah, I can hardly express my disappointment. Six. I'm sorry, Nathan. I just jumped right ahead. Good afternoon, commissioners. My Good information afternoon. is under tab G in your board books. And as Commissioner Dean noted, I have six items for today. Item A is the appeal of a revocation of an armed private security license on August 10th, 2023. This denial is based on the licensee's misuse of official information on June 12th, 2023, in violation of Section 576.050 of the Revised Statutes of Missouri. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. And the private officer's licensing unit recommends upholding the August 10th revocation of this licensee. This is William T. Hamburg, right? That's correct. Um, is there a motion? I move we overturn that and grant him his license. All right. Is, is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? Can I ask a question on this, if I may? Yes. So the, the concern here is that Sieges was provided to a victim to then use to file a report. And it seems like it's a very technical violation of that standard, um, that the, there were good intentions to assist her with filing a police report. But at the base of this, the fundamental question is, 
access to information that is not otherwise available, nor should it be used in the way that it was today. Is that the heart of this matter? That's correct. So while it could be somewhat innocent and no, well, there could be harm done here because there could be It'd be problematic to now pursue this this matter that she was looking for help with originally because we can't use that information now is that also correct yes that's my understanding commissioner um if uh, you'd like more information i can have tammy gallagher who's the manager of the private officer unit uh, come up and speak to that Ms. gallagher would you come up please Yeah, once um, he gave the information to the victim, she was the victim of the crime, so she didn't, she was not supposed to have that information. They could have just given the license plate information to the officers when they walked in the report, but instead they printed it out and gave it. And that's a violation of Regis. Thank you. The information that we received from the Highway Patrol said that because it went to a victim, we could not prosecute the person that that caused the damage is that correct correct, correct. it's not, not doesn't have anything to do with the value of the mirror or anything that was because the information was improperly used okay any other you might as well stay up okay. up here All right. you don't have to stand you can sit down but we've got six of these so who knows i, I hate to Actually, I will play lawyer here. The Highway Patrol representation that there could be no prosecution because they're contending that the full tart. I get fruit of the poisonous tree. I guess I'll go to you, counsel. You're not a criminal. I mean, you could. It'd be, it'd be a harder case. But from the factual basis of it, the suspect rips off a car mirror at a local school um, and... There are facts that could establish that in municipal court, you could get that conviction almost every day. I'm not, I'm just not sure I agree with the premise. So I guess that's why I seconded the motion. I'll ask this about Mr. Homburg. What, where was his employment at that time though? At the school district. At the school district. Mm -hmm. So we are, we're taking his livelihood for, and per, and there's a mistake in the structure here, but we're doing that because he, um, I guess, assisted in someone who had some damage to their vehicle, um, understand it all. All right. I mean, I, I get it. But. Well, and didn't he state in his report the only reason he gave it to her is because we couldn't make it out to file a report? Right. So Probably he handed it to her number. to take it to file a report. So I don't think there was anything intentionally And that's why I'm motioned to yeah, right. so reinstate motion, his license. The motion has been made and seconded that his license be um, reinstated. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. Motion carries. Next one. Item B is the appeal of a revocation of an armed security license on August 24th, 2023. This revocation is based on the licensee's unprofessional behavior during firearms qualification on August 22nd, 2023. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. The private officer's licensing unit recommends upholding the revocation of this license. This is Mr. Davis. That's correct. Is there a motion to, uh, a motion on this issue? Either way. <laughs> I move to affirm the recommendation. Is there a second? No second. Is there a motion? Can you restate the motion? The motion is to affirm. Affirm, yes. the, affirm the Yes. Affirm the department's recommendation to revoke the license. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to take this man's license away. Is there any discussion? I think in this situation, given particularly that it is firearms training, this is about a, a license to have said firearm, at least in this security position. I think it's it's very connected with what we're licensing and authorizing this person to do. And that's why. 
Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Motion, wait a minute. Motion carries. Item C is the appeal of a denial of an armed private security officer license on August 17th, 2023. The basis for this denial is the applicant's resignation under the threat of termination from another department in December 2020. Please let me know if you have any questions related to this denial. Again, the private officer licensing unit recommends upholding the denial of this license. And this is the Payton uh, denial. Mr. Payton. Mr. Payton. Is there a motion on Mr. Payton's license? Uh, I move that we do not uphold this and reinstate its license. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. We are not upholding the decision. He will get his license back. Number D. Item D is the appeal of a denial of an armed private security officer license on August 28th, 2023. The basis for the denial is the applicant's resignation from another department during an investigation pending termination in 2023 and the applicant's failure to disclose the internal investigation and pending termination as part of his private security officer license application. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. This is the moral uh, appeal. And again, the private officer licensing unit recommends upholding the denial of the license. Is there a motion on this? I move that we do not uh, uphold the denial of the license. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. That so you're we grant, wait a minute, I just want to make sure I understand. You're granting the, you move to grant the appeal. Wants him to keep his license. Yes. Let him keep, to keep the license. license. Yes. It's right. not granting the appeal. So we do not it's uphold. His appeal of the denial. I understand, the David. Revocation. He's, They've yeah. asked us to sustain the right. appeal. Right. He's going to keep his license. Right. You're, they're at, is that they're, right? Right. He's going right. to get a license. He's going to get a license. He's going to attain a license. Yes. Okay. Are we clear on what we're voting on? Yes. All right. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Item E is the appeal of a denial of an armed, armed private security license on August 16th, 2023. The basis for this denial is Ms. Pearson's actions on January 25th, 2023, which resulted in her arrest in Raytown for a violation of an ordinance regarding assault and resisting arrest, and her February 1st, 2023 arrest in Kansas City for assault. If you have any questions, please let me know. And again, the private officer's licensing unit recommends upholding the denial of the license. Move to uphold the recommendation, which would mean she does not get a license. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. The final, I'm sorry. The final item F is the appeal of the denial of an application for an unarmed private security license on September 8th, 2023. The basis for this denial is the applicant's March 15th, 2022 conviction in Mason, Macon County, Tennessee for possession of methamphetamine. If you have any questions, please let me know. And this is the Perry appeal. And again, the private officer licensing unit recommends upholding the denial of the license. I move to uphold the denial of the license. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes my report. Thank you. All right. We're not going to hear from Mr. Bennigan. And do we have public comments? I don't have a, do you have one, a list? Oh, Bethany's Bethany 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 right yeah. Give it to David, please. Steve Young. Casey Lee. <clears throat> so uh, what does community trust look like to you? 
To me, community trust comes when police are held accountable for the same crimes they arrest folks for. You can't continue to beg for trust when each and every one of you are fine with keeping killer cops on our streets to continue their terror. Example, Blaine Newton. Yesterday, the Jackson County Legislature introduced a resolution urging the governor not to pardon Eric DeVolcanier. That same day, that same day, guess what the president of the FOP was doing? He was personally calling the legislature to lobby folks to vote no on that resolution. So this is how he spends his time, fighting hard to keep a guilty ex-detective out of jail who was convicted of second degree voluntary manslaughter and armed criminal action <clears throat> by a respected judge and sentenced to six years. His actions are a total reflection on each and every one of you who wears that uniform. Even with all his efforts, the resolution still passed with five votes. So let me tell you what the community sees. We see how leadership, how leadership was silent when the AG pulled his stunt by not signing the brief to uphold the conviction of the Vulcanier and then saying he didn't agree with a judge's decision. What if we had seen the chief of police speaking out against the AG's action or even members of the BOPC? What if leaders in this building were seen urging the government, the governor, not to pardon the Vulcanier? Leadership like that would resonate throughout our community. For some reason, you cannot connect the dots. And because of this, you will continue to have a low soft rate and no trust from the community. I'll say it again in closing. Police accountability will bring community trust that you're asking for, period. Thank you. Minutes? No. That's it. That's it. I didn't know how many was on. All right. Um, next on the agenda is approval of the minutes for the open session of August 22, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Mr. Kenner. I have nothing at this time. Mr. Lucas. Mayor Thank you, Madam Lucas. Chair. I may just say, actually, in response to the previous public comment, although the gentleman won't hear me, at least at this point, um, I find it rather inappropriate to engage in criminal processes while they're still ongoing. Um, to the extent that something like this is coming to my legislative body, I would hope that um, we at least recognize that we'll let certain processes play out before engaging in that. And I would actually commend our command staff for not engaging in such uh, discussion while um, folks are availing themselves of their rights. Uh, and I say that with all respect to everyone involved in the situation. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree. Um, Mr. Tobert. Um, I don't really have anything other than I did send Dr. Kim Beatty a text, who is the chairman of MCC Colleges, to talk about if there is a, a way to maybe recruit students, and then I might ask, is there a provision to set up part-time uh, call takers if we're able to get something like that done? Great, thank you. Mr. Whitaker. Thank you, Madam President. We spent a lot of time today um, in talking about uh, what appears to be a common theme, and that is the need for people. So first, I um, support the strategy of get, keep, and shift. Get, meaning attract new talent. Keep, meaning keep the talent we have, and then shift talent to the extent necessary so that we can become as efficient as we can under circumstances where we are under um, enormous pressure to find, find people and keep people. Um, that said, uh, I think it is necessary for this group um, to recognize those issues, but also take a step back and look across the enterprise. We see it playing out with our law enforcement. We see it playing out with communications. And just be aware that across the enterprise, it could reveal itself in some way that we don't see today, but start looking at those trends in other places. I'm not looking for an answer right now. It's just 
taking from a leadership perspective an enterprise view to make sure that what we know is in front of us and playing out in certain respects could come back and be a topic for us in future dates and try and get ahead of that now. That's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Kramer. Along those lines, I just want to thank our staff because I know you are constantly working to recruit and get people out there. And I, I realize how difficult that is with unemployment rates being as low as they are. There's just not a whole lot of bodies to choose from. And so it makes it extremely difficult with what you're doing. And I appreciate everything you guys do to, to try and get us those bodies and, and make us <coughs> successful. So thank you for all your hard work and efforts. I agree with that. Um, do I hear a motion to go into closed session? Move that we adjourn this meeting and go into closed session. To Motion's been made and seconded. Close. All those in favor say aye. <laughs> Aye. Roll call. Albert Aye. Whitaker Aye. Aye. Kramer Aye. Thank you, David. We're adjourned to go into closed session. Here's my practice. Yes, sir.